This all started when I left college. After getting my degree in journalism, I found my prospects of employment very slim indeed. I've always been quite a homely girl and have never really liked being too far from my parents, being an only child. However, I knew that in order to find employment, I would have to brave the world and leave for one of the big cities near my small local town, probably moving there full time. So I sent out a bunch of resumes and got nothing back. I knew I would have to try harder. But it was summer, I'd recently graduated, and thought I'd enjoy my final summer of freedom before starting work in the adult world. My parents have always had a close family friend called Ray, who owns a big camping spot in the woods. They needed counsellors for the children going camping, and seeing as I'd been camping there many times in the past, I volunteered my services. The pay was okay, and the work was only for a few weeks, and would definitely be enough to keep me going doing nothing all summer, just to give me time to send out resumes and chill with the girls. You know, the usual. So. I called him up, and within two days, my stuff had been packed up, and I was ready to drive myself down to the camp. This was the first time that I had done the drive myself. I realised it was a lot longer when you had to do the drive, instead of just play your Nintendo in the back. But still, it wasn't that bad. I arrived set up myself in one of the dorms with some of the other counsellors and introduced myself. The children wouldn't be arriving for a few more days. They ran through some trainings with me and we all got to know each other pretty well. The person who I got along best with was called Beth. She was studying at one of the local universities and told me all about her course, Psychology and we really struck a chord with each other, and tried to keep our groups together during the camping sessions. But anyway, cut to a few weeks ahead. My troop and I are going on a little walk in the woods, and just chit-chatting as we go along. We're making our way to one of the den areas, when suddenly one of the quieter girls of the group pipes up, and asks if anyone's had trouble sleeping. Now, it's not uncommon for campers to have trouble sleeping out here. Number one, because they miss their parents, or because they're simply not used to or familiar with sleeping in tents. So, for me, it was a very normal thing to say. I bring her to my side and tell her that it's perfectly normal, explain what I just told you guys, and try and ease her down a little bit, and explain that it was all good. But she shakes her head and tells me that it was for none of those reasons that she feels a bit uncomfortable and had trouble sleeping. She told me it's because of the running at night. I give her a furrowed brow and ask her what she meant. She says that every other night since she's been here, so roughly four days, she's been woken up in the middle of the night by someone running very odd. I told her that there shouldn't be anyone out, but that if she wanted, I would stay out with her until she fell asleep, just to make sure that there was no one around. She agreed. That night, I stayed out. I made sure my campers were asleep, I was around the fire, and just cooking some marshmallows myself, chatting with Beth, my other counsellor, and seeing if anything spooky would happen. I really doubted anything would happen, and nothing did, for the first hour. At this point I was getting tired, we were both getting bored, and our little marshmallow bag had run out painfully about half an hour ago, and we were just sitting there, poking the dying embers of our fire, with topics for conversation slowly dying out. Just as we decided to put the fire out, and make our way back, 
to our own sleeping quarters, did we hear something in the forest. The sound of footsteps. I tell Beth to be quiet, and we look around. We can't see anything. There's still a fair bit of light from other campfires that are dying down as well. I look around, still nothing. So we make our way back quietly, keep looking over our shoulder. I get changed into my pyjamas, and I'm about to fall asleep. But this thing is still bothering me. I still can't make out why I'm feeling so uncomfortable. I was sure that it was just an animal. So, I put my shoes back on in my pyjamas and slowly creep outside. I'm just trying to make everything out in the dark as I don't want to be seen or heard. And I sit behind a tree and there's just enough light to make out a few shapes in the distance, all stationary so I know they're trees as well. While I wait, in the silence of darkness, do I hear something again, rustling further down. I wait patiently, seeing if whatever is there will emerge from the trees exposing itself. Would it be a person or an animal? My cell phone was in my pocket, just waiting to dial the cops. It felt like an eternity, but there was no movement, and I was very close to giving up when before long, I saw it. My phone at this point was in hand, waiting to press the power button to call the cops. But what I saw, I have no words for. This thing, hairy humanoid creature, emerged from behind a tree. Only for a split second was it stationary as it pushed off the ground with its legs and ran at very high speeds. It ran so quickly through the woods, I barely had time to glimpse at it for more than a second. It was tall, incredibly tall, far too tall to be normal. It made very little sound as it ran, as it passed my campers and ran deep into the forest. I tried following it with my eyes, but it was too fast. And after a few minutes had passed, and I had regained my composure, did I walk up to the tents of my campers. The girl from earlier who was scared was already out of her tent, and asked if I'd heard it. I told her that I had, but did not tell her what I had seen. I just said it was a deer, and to go back to sleep, and she gave me a weird look and crawled back into her tent to, I assume, fall asleep. I didn't sleep that night, and I didn't do a good job with the troop the next day. I really didn't want to stay much longer after that. I didn't want to see or hear that creature again, so I made no effort to stay out longer than I needed to, and tried to pass out before the time I suspected it would be out. Fortunately for me, I never saw or heard it again, and I couldn't have been happier to escape those woods and go back to civilization after those few weeks. I haven't been camping since, and never intend to do so again. I never did figure out what it was, but I think perhaps it's better that way. I've always lived in the countryside and still do. When I was younger, me and my two sisters would often play in the woods behind our house. We had this huge area to roam around in, and as we lived very isolated, we'd never seen anyone there before but us. This meant we could roam around to our heart's content, build forts, biking trails, whatever we wanted. This was our nature playground. Our parents would always be able to shout and we'd come, as we'd never venture far, although these woods did extend very far indeed. There were a few occasions when we thought we would hike deeper to see what we would find, but for the most part, 
all that we would encounter would be more and more trees. However, one time, my sister opted for us to go a different route, sort of to the left of where our house was. We filled up our bags with snacks and water and went on our way. That's when we made it to a seemingly forgotten graveyard. This graveyard was nestled in the woods. Any fences that had been there had long eroded away or collapsed, maybe even the metal stolen. But the graves were there and visible, some completely covered in ivy and other plant life. We started looking around, taking the plants off some of the graves, seeing if it were possible to read any of the names. Most of them we couldn't make out, not even the dates. But a few which I can no longer remember were still barely legible. My sister had an idea that if we got some crayons and some paper, we might be able to trace the names. But we never did. However, after going to that part of the woods, did strange things start to happen? Now, remember, as I said, this was a very, very isolated place, and we'd never seen anyone here before. We'd start going out, doing our regular stuff, like go to our bike trail, and someone would have knocked over all of our cones. That'd be strange. My sisters just assumed it was the wind. On another occasion, our fort, which we had taken years building up, made of sticks and stuff, had been completely destroyed. All the sticks pulled apart and left on a pile on the floor. We couldn't explain this one away. My dad had been angry with us for staying out far too late in the forest, and so we went to confront him about it, accusing him of doing this. He gave us a quizzical look and said he didn't even know where our fault was and resumed working in his office. This freaked us out. But we tried to put it to the back of our minds and saw this as an opportunity to try and build the fort again. That's when things escalated. It was summer and so we were usually out back playing until the sun was going down. As we were walking home one night, with about three minutes until we reached our back door, did we hear footsteps behind us. All three of us instantly turn around. This is the first time we've ever heard anyone here before other than us. And we look. There's no one. We carry on walking, and about 15 seconds later, the footsteps resume. But they're at the same distance that they were before. We turn around no one's there. And then, when we look forward back to our house, do we instantly see an apparition. The figure of a young girl. She was transparent, and skipped away through the woods. Our eyes all tried to follow her movements, but she passed a tree and could not be seen again. She never emerged past it. We all screamed and ran all the way home. All of us were babbling to my mother about what we had seen, and she wasn't able to calm us down for about 20 minutes or get words out of us as to what we saw. When we finally were able to explain, each of us told our account that we had seen a girl skipping in the forest and that she went behind a tree and disappeared. One of my sisters even said that as we were running, she looked at the tree that she'd skipped past, and that she definitely wasn't there. We were all in meltdown mode. My mother, bless her, tried her best to convince us that she believed us, but I know deep down she didn't. I only, in later life, realised why we may have seen what we did. Could it have been that we disturbed her grave? Or by visiting the grave, had we encouraged her to come out and play? We didn't go out for the rest of the summer. We played indoors and in the garden. But 
after winter and when spring rolled around, did we start braving the woods again. We never saw an apparition like that again, but it wouldn't be uncommon for us to hear things while playing. Probably the scariest, besides the apparition of course, was the time that we heard laughter coming from all around us, seemingly every direction of the forest infested by this childish giggle, which caused us to run home. Knowing our parents didn't believe, we simply didn't tell them about it. We're all grown up now, but when the three of us meet up, we often talk about our experiences growing up and contemplate what it could have been that was haunting our forest. A little girl or something more sinister? We may never know, but that's good enough for me. When I went back to my parents' house, I took a walk through the woods and it turns out the graveyard is still there. I mean, it wasn't going anywhere. But what I find most curious of all is that when I told my parents about it, they didn't even know it existed and it had only been a 15 minute walk away from their property, at most. Creepy stuff. I grew up in Alaska, just on the bubble of civilization. There, even in the big cities, you'll get bear and moose and such. I was walking home from the bus stop. Our driveway was about a half mile long through woods. I heard noises to my right and stopped, hoping it was anything but the one animal that scares me. And then it stepped out of the trees. I froze. My blood felt cold and stopped in my veins. It was a moose, female, fully grown, standing maybe 20 feet from me in the middle of the road. It stopped and turned to look at me. I was scared with no backup plan. What can a 12 year old do up against a fully grown moose? Then it happened. I heard another noise. I thought I was truly dead. This time, it was behind me. I thought now my life was over. I'm between a mama and baby moose and I am going to die. I remember feeling frozen and not at all tranquil and at peace. I couldn't even scream. From the edge of my eyesight, I saw the second moose emerging from the thick strand of all the trees and disappear behind me. I could hear the steps on the soft dirt. My eyes locked onto the moose in front of me, trying to will it to stay calm. I stopped breathing. Then I felt it. A gentle whoosh of warm air down the back of my neck, followed by the unmistakable sound of a force inhale. The moose behind me was sniffing my head. I could feel the breath, hear the nostrils flare. Some neighbor had dogs off in the woods away, and I must have gotten out of their yard and started barking inside the trees. That startled both moose that turned and ran back the way they came, crashing into the small trees and leaving. To this day, the only animal I'm afraid of is moose. I've been fishing with brown bears, had black bears say hi as they walk by my camp. Mountain lions stalk us and then leave. It doesn't rattle me until I see a cow moose alone. And then I just hope to whatever is higher than me that I am not between her and her cub. This happened a long time ago. I'd say this happened when I was around eight, 11 years ago in fact. My family and I were on holiday in Spain, in a city quite close to Barcelona. We went to a very big and luxurious resort with a ton of sports fields, from basketball to soccer. It took up a lot of space and it had 
really tall fences around the perimeter to make sure no one could get in at night. To give you some perspective, I think they had eight soccer fields, four basketball courts, two rugby pitches, and probably some other stuff too. During the day, all of the fields were full of people playing sports, and it was always a ton of fun there. But at night, the perimeter closes. I stayed late with a friend. I don't remember his name, so we'll call him Brian. Brian and I didn't want to go home yet, so we stayed a bit longer to shoot penalties on the soccer field. Eventually, they closed the fence, but since we were too far away from them to see us and vice versa, we only found out that the fence was closed when we tried to leave. This was already scary. It was a huge, unlit place in a foreign country, surrounded by big fences. After freaking out for a little, we decided we didn't want to get into trouble. So we set out to follow the fence to look for holes through which we could escape instead of calling for help. After a solid 20 minutes, we find a hole. But it's not connected to the resort, but to a dark forest. We figured it wasn't a large forest and that it would be safe given that it was right next to the resort. We go through the hole and begin crossing the forest. A mere five minutes later, we enter a large, bare spot with an old, damaged, graffitied concrete shed. We avoided it as best we could. But soon we heard some glass bottles moving around in the shed. Out walks this old man. He stares at us for 10 seconds. We are paralyzed by fear. He looks deranged, like someone who had been homeless for the larger part of his life. His clothes were ripped, hair and beard very long and disgusting. He even had a limp. He coughs, which wakes up another man in the shed. This looks exactly like Charles Patashik from Breaking Bad. They start to slowly walk in our direction, speaking to us in Spanish. We slowly back up. They see this, and they charge. They start running, screaming, and throwing stuff at us. We are running for our lives. The forest is pitch black. We can barely see ahead of us, let alone see if there's an end to this seemingly infinite forest. After about 10 minutes of running, we reach the edge of the forest. We were on a small town road next to a huge cliff. There were no houses, no people, and we were still being chased. We follow the road uphill, finally gaining some ground on the homeless psychopaths. The road ends. The only thing we see is a mansion without any burning lights. We figure it's all or nothing, and we climb their gate and hide in their backyard. The homeless men follow us, but by the time they managed to get in, we were already hidden in some dense, dark bushes. They made quite a bit of noise, which woke up the residents. Out comes a man screaming and looking around his garden. He closely passes by us, but did not see us. He was holding a gun. I didn't get a close look, but I think it was a shotgun, an older one that holds two shells. He inevitably spots the homeless men and fired a warning shot into the air. The Charles Patashik looking man charges at him, but gets knocked down. He forces the homeless men out of his garden at gunpoint. We fought safe for a second, until we realized we were in a shotgun-wielding man's garden, and that we did not know where the homeless men were. We wait a bit to be sure that the man is asleep, and that the homeless men have left. When we leave, around a half hour later, the men are gone, and the roads are quiet. We follow the same road, but now downhill. 
and run into a small town. We still have no idea where we are. It has been three hours since we left the resort, and we finally realised what just happened and freaked out. After walking for another 10 to 15 minutes, we see a house with people in the living room. We ring the bell and try to ask the way. Most Spanish people don't speak Dutch, and we didn't really speak English all that well. We told her the name of the resort, and she points downhill. This seems like a fairly standard road. We stick closely to the houses and follow the road. I didn't know this at this point, but apparently there was an abandoned slaughterhouse close to the entrance of the resort. We heard Dutch voices from somewhere around the building, so we go in asking directions. Enter a bloody hellhole. Everywhere there's blood. On the floor, on the walls, on the equipment, and even the ceiling. Bloody knives everywhere. It wasn't a very nice experience. The other people run into us as we ask directions. It's a two minute walk away. When we finally hit the resort, the staff don't let us in because they don't know if we're residents of the resort. They make us tell them the house of our parents to come and get us. There were still pancakes left when I got back and I played Pokemon with my brother. My mum gave me 10 euros for the arcade the next day, which was when my bike got stolen. This happened around three years ago, when I was away from school on a trip. The trip was for younger students. A few people from my year in school had been asked to go to help look after the younger children. To give perspectives, I was 14 when this happened. I was about five foot two, female, and probably weighed less than a hundred pounds. One particular day, the children were doing an orienteering activity in the woods, basically using a compass to follow a trail to find your way to the end of it. It was the third day into the trip, and by this time a group of four boys, who I now know all have severe behavioural problems, had taken a liking to me for whatever reason. Therefore, when the children got asked who they wanted their chaperone of the group to be, they chose me. We started the activity, and for the first ten minutes the group of boys seemed to be doing what they were supposed to do, and I could see other groups from my school in front and behind us. So I thought everything was going fine. The woods that we were doing this activity in were huge. I had no experience with using a compass, and neither did the boys in the group. The boys I was looking after quickly became disinterested with the activity, and started to run in random directions, climb trees, etc. After around 40 minutes of chasing these boys in random directions through the woods that I'd never been in before, I realised we were completely lost and expected to be at the finish line soon. I began to panic. I was only 14 and had been put in charge of younger children. Therefore, I knew I would be held responsible for getting them lost. I ended up being able to scare the boys enough, telling them the teachers would go crazy if we weren't back soon, to make them focus and help me find a proper path, as by now, we were walking through bushes and trees, and completely off any type of path. This is where it gets creepy. After walking down this path for 10 minutes, I see a clearing in the trees up ahead. I couldn't see what was in this clearing, so hoping it was an exit from the woods, I started jogging up to it, followed by the boys. As I turned the corner and got a better look at the clearing, I stopped dead in my tracks. It's hard to explain how I felt when I first saw this man. All I can say is that I have never felt in so much danger before in my life. 
My whole body was completely glued to this spot, and I could feel the colour drain from my face. In the clearing, there was a man sat on a bench. He looked to be around his mid to late forties, slightly overweight, and looked homeless. He was balding. However, the hair he had left looked damp, like it was greasy. His eyes looked glazed over, and his mouth sort of hung open. That's when I realised on closer inspection, he had red stains all around his mouth. It's hard to describe this man, but the vibes I got were pure evil. Think Fat Trevor from GTA 5. At this point, my fight or flight instinct kicked in. I spun round to see the boys behind me, who I had completely blocked out. They all looked absolutely terrified, as they had been stood behind me looking at this man too. I shouted run to the boys, and sprinted past them as fast as I could. I can honestly say I've never run so fast in my life. I could hear all the boys running behind me, and they were literally screaming bloody murder. I didn't even look back for a second, to be completely honest. I was only thinking about myself in this moment, and getting the hell out of there fast. I knew the man was chasing behind us, because the boys were screaming, and he's coming behind us. I don't know how the boys were shouting so much. All I could think of was my imminent death. Fortunately, my creeper was overweight and couldn't keep up with five teenagers who just got the biggest adrenaline rush of their lives. I'll never know what would have happened if we didn't run, or if the man caught up with us. And I can honestly say I'm glad. We came across two elderly women walking their dogs about a half hour after the incident, and managed to hitchhike a lift back to the camping grounds. I knew it was stupid, but it was either sweet old ladies offering help, or stay in the woods with fat cannibal Trevor. So creepy guy in the woods, let's not meet again. I am an au pair in Sweden and spend most of my summer weekends in my family's summer house, which is out in the archipelago outside of Stockholm. Breathtakingly beautiful place, but boonies don't even begin to cover it. The nearest neighbour is about a 30 minute brisk walk away, and after that, there's nothing except ocean and thick, terrifying forest. This particular night was date night for my parents, so I was left with the two children alone out in the terrifying murder house. There are two houses on the property, one main house and the other is a guest house, where of course I got to sleep all alone. It's literally two meters from the ocean. The game plan was to go exploring in the forest, which I had never done alone with the children, only with the parents, and then walk to pick up my boyfriend from the bus stop. He would stay with us until our parents got home from their date, and then my boyfriend and I would go to sleep in the guest house. So while in the house, I kept getting the jitters, Things were definitely stranger, and it wasn't just because I was alone with two children. I grew up in the forest, but several times we heard the birds calling out these weird distress call noises, and big flocks would appear. A long time before we were even close enough to scare them, and there were big, thudding footsteps nearby. I was terrified of there being a big moose or something. We came to a little hidden lake, and then things got even weirder. Though the place is unpopulated for miles, there was a woman sitting on a rock opposite us, about 60 feet away. She was naked and wet, as though she had been swimming even though the water was much too cold for that. 
when she saw us, she stood up and did this weird pacing thing, like she would get too close to the water and then back away, then move close again, like she wanted to cross and come towards us, but there was the obvious lake barrier in the way. The kids were mildly worried, and it wasn't before long that I ushered them back the way we'd came, in order for us to make our way out of the forest. On the road to pick up my boyfriend, I had the oddest sensation of being watched. I was really terrified, actually. But we met him with no incident and returned to the cabin just as the sun was setting. We gave the kids dinner, and just as they were curling up with the Swedish comic book, the main door slammed open. I remember thinking it was a real person. There was a heavy footfall, and then bam, like someone had stomped and flung open the door. But there was no one there. My boyfriend went out and had a look around. Nothing. It must have been the wind, of course. Right? It's always the wind. While we were in bed reading the story, we could hear skittering around and clawing from underneath where we were. I knew for a fact that rats and other rodents camped out at the other end of the house, because that's where the kitchen was. But whatever. I had a really awful feeling in the pit of my stomach, but my rational boyfriend promised me it was a fox or weasel, and not to get worked up. Fast forward to 3am, I had to pee. My boyfriend and I were in the guest house. My bosses had come home long ago. I'm a badass, and pee outside with no problems. So I stumbled out of the darkness and squatted down outside the guest house to pee. And it was right after, when I straightened up and adjusted my shirt, that I got that awful feeling of dread. It was the same one I had in the forest. The one I had when I was on my way to see my boyfriend. I had it while we were camped out inside the house. I had felt just fine in the guest house with my boyfriend. But now that feeling was back. Behind the guest house is a steep hill, at about a 45 degree angle, and on that hill sits what we call the ghost house. It was the house of an old soldier in the 1600s, and now it just sits there all terrifying and vacant. There's a trail going from the ghost house to the main summer home, and my boss had lit the trail with dim, useless solar lamps. You wouldn't be able to read by the light of the lamps. But the idea was to light your way up the hill and not trip and die over a tree root or something. I could sense a presence moving up the trail. That means something moving from the main house to the ghost house. I squinted in the dark and saw a shape of a person, but that wasn't right because by the solar light, you can see color, jeans or a shirt or jacket, and ours all had reflectors on them. But this was just a black shadow. I thought, an animal perhaps, but then ruled it out as it walked on two legs, walking really fast and smoothly. But then it slowed and seemed to notice me. I was actually terrified. Good thing I had just peed, right? But then my intuition told me to commence stare down. And so I did. I was fighting to see in the dark. And just when I couldn't focus, I realized there were two very softly illuminated eyes on its face. And they were on me. It slowed down to a stroll. And I could see the eyes changing tint from a bluish to a yellowish glow based on what they were in relation to the solar lamps. They were catching light. So I started. It was going so slow now that this felt surreal and I could hear twigs snapping 
and other noises that a real-life, non-imagined creature makes. I remember actually thinking, this isn't a hallucination. It's walking on the ground. And then the weirdest part. Instead of moving at a normal, relative height, the way human eyes or animal eyes would, the eyes start kind of hovering. They were six feet off the ground. Suddenly would dip down to four feet, then back up to five, and they never left me. But the direction this thing was moving in never changed. It kept going up the hill. The eyes and the figure faded out into the darkness once the solar lamps ended, and I went back into the guest house and locked the door. I heard nothing else that night. My boyfriend slept through everything, but early in the morning he woke up, whimpering from a nightmare. And that's the only time anything has ever happened at that summer house, and I was there collectively for a month. I was doing a long hike, from Springer Mountain to Fontana Dam, that's about 165 miles. I was a little behind schedule on day three, where I had planned to take a near zero day and spend some time at mountain crossings. Initially, I was going to spend night two in the hostel there, but a big storm prevented me from crossing Bloody Mountain the day before. As a result, I had to revamp my plan and add about seven miles to my day. So after a soda, and a burger at Mountain Crossing, I hit the trail again. I came to a road crossing, and there's this guy with an old 80s style external frame pack taking a break. Being me, I stopped, pulled out a cliff bar and a smoke, and decided to have a conversation for a bit. I could use the break anyway. We talked for a bit, and I alluded to which shelter I was heading to. Do not do this if you don't trust the person. That was my first mistake. The guy seemed a little odd, but this was the Appalachian Trail. Everyone is weird. At that point, we're all walking to Maine. We started talking about 1pm. He had started his day at Neil's Gap, and I started on the other side of Blood Mountain. We'd started at roughly the same time, and I had taken a two hour break. My pace easily put me ahead of this guy by seven or eight miles. The shelter I had alluded to was actually out of his range, or so I thought. There were also three shelters between us and my final destination. We parted ways and I kept on trucking. I get to camp and do my usual thing. I made good time so I actually had quite a bit of downtime before hike at midnight, which is 8pm. Several hours had passed, and I had peppered for the night, and was reworking my plan while talking to the other hikers, and this guy rolls into camp, looking like he had just gone on the Bataan Death March. He trucked it up to try and catch me up. The guy started to show his true colours in camp, he was really loud and obnoxious, and would not leave me alone. I decided that night I would carry a bit of extra water and do breakfast outside of camp to try and distance myself away from him. The next morning, I was up just before sunrise. I packed and hit the trail. Then, two miles later, I tweaked my knee on some rock crossing. Ugh, that did it. I needed to get some rest and ice on this thing. I go to the gap where you can either hitch west into Hiawisi, where most people go, or hitch east into Helen. I decided to go into Helen as I figured I'd also take advantage of the Bavarian atmosphere that the town provides. Lo and behold, a few hours later this same guy comes rolling into my hotel. I found out later he had asked some southbounders about me, and figured out where I'd gone. Holy crap. Now this is creepy. I had to get him away from me. 
I figured, while in town, I'd kill him with kindness. So I got some beers and made some more conversation. We were talking about our plans, and I knew this was my chance. I told him that because of my knee, I was probably going to take the next day off as well, and continue on after that. He said he'd join me, just like I expected. I said cool, and went to my room. As soon as I got to my room, I packed up and set my alarm for 4.30am. I phoned the owner of the hotel to make sure she could give me a ride to the trail that early. The next morning, I quietly grabbed my gear and hopped into her car. We headed the few miles up the road to the trailhead, and I basically started running. I never saw the guy again, but I heard stories about him up the trail. That was a hell of a trip. I had a bear bed down within arm's reach of me in my tent. That's a story for another day though. I haven't done a long hike in a few years. Telling these stories really does make me want to get back into the trail. Perhaps I will in summer. My family moved from the Maryland mountains to West Palm Beach, Florida when I was seven. Waterbeds were trendy at the time, so everyone in the house had one. On a few occasions, I would wake up to this odd smell in the air. I couldn't put my finger on how to describe it as a kid, so my folks didn't think much of it, and said it was the plastic waterbeds I was smelling. One night in particular sticks out in my mind, where I woke up to that weird odour, but there was someone with me. I thought it was my dad, because he told me he would be in to check on me. When I rolled over to look, I was caught completely off guard by snake people. Three of them. Their faces looked like a snake-human hybrid, and they had big, slitted eyes. I doubt they were more than three and a half feet tall, and they were watching me. I was frozen in fear staring back at them, while my waterbed sloshed from me rolling over. Next thing I know, it's morning, and I'm eating breakfast. Years later, my mother and I are out taking a walk. It looks like it's going to storm any minute, and there's a strong smell of ozone in the air. She looks at me and says, that's the same smell from when the aliens took you. And she tells me about when we first moved to Florida. Three little lizard men took me to a saucer in our yard. She wanted to stop them at first, but they convinced her I would be okay and wouldn't remember anything. So she went back to her bedroom and watched the saucer go into the sky from the window, leaving that strong ozone smell. After that, she went back to bed and apparently never thought to tell me until I was 30. Now, every time I smell a storm coming, I get the willies. This happened while I was in Boy Scouts in Utah. The first thing happened when I was eight to 10 years old. We were backpacking in one of the surrounding mountains of Salt Lake Valley. I can't remember which one. We'd finally reached our campsite after a few hours of hiking with heavy backpacks around dusk. Lit our camp stoves, ate dinner, and then set up tents for bed. Since it was a clear cloudless summer night, my friend and I decided to leave the rain fly off and stargaze before sleeping. Our campsite was an open area, so we had a hell of a view of the Milky Way and thousands of stars. It was beautiful. The tent was kind of cramped. It was a two-person tent, but really only one person could comfortably sleep in it. But we didn't care. It was one night. About an hour or two after, we started chatting and stargazing. We even saw the ISS pass slowly over us. One star was flashing, different colours. We thought nothing of it at first since planets tend to do that, but then it started zipping around randomly. 
from one end of the sky to the other, without pattern, all the while still flashing different colours. At first I thought I was seeing things, but my friend was seeing it too. It had kind of freaked us out, but we just watched it. It kept zipping around the sky at insane speeds, occasionally stopping for a few seconds, then continued zipping around. At first, we thought maybe someone else was pulling a prank, but everyone else was asleep. We heard no laughter and no laser pointer could change colour like that, so we kept watching it, never actually feeling afraid. And then, after what seemed like hours, it was just gone. We lay there for about an hour watching to see if it would return. It never did. The next morning, we packed up, hiked back to our cars and left. Not sure if this next part is related, as we could have just been dehydrated. But it was pretty silent the whole ride home. And when we stopped for lunch on the way, someone said they didn't feel good. Like, throw up bad. At the time, I thought nothing of it, other than, stay away from me, I don't want to be sick too. He was fine the following Monday at the meeting, so obviously nothing too bad. But now, all these years later... I have to wonder, whatever that star slash planet or even UFO was, did it make him sick or was it just dehydration? This is another thing that happened to me. It was during my very last camp out when I was about to turn 18. It was at City of Rocks on the Idaho side. On the way there, we stopped at the skeleton of a house to wait for the rest of the cars. It was bare framework, half collapsed, and absolutely littered with debris. Even a large dugout rectangular hole, probably for the basement. Being the stupid teenagers we were, we decided to explore a little. The leaders telling us to be careful, and to watch out for nails and potentially snakes. No one was hurt, even the couple of boys who decided to jump down into the basement area. Nothing of interest was found. So we got back into the cars and drove the rest of the way. Not sure if it's related, but something I've decided to add since it was at least interesting. The rest of the weekend went as usual. Even the one kid who always gets hurt manages to have to be taken to the hospital. We're forbidden to climb the rocks after that. So to protest, we broke the no electronics rule. The leaders didn't get upset at this and agreed that it was fair. Another friend and I, the one I'm very close with, had a Slenderman game on his tablet, which was still popular at the time. This is kind of important later. It was after midnight, we're all in our tents, and our electronics have exhausted their batteries. We lay down looking out the window at the very small mountain we all climbed all weekend. It's big enough to take a good 10 minutes to free climb but small enough to see from the very top of our window about 20 yards away from base. So, more of a huge mountain-shaped rock. Anyway, it was about that time when we saw several shadowy figures that looked to be crouching low on the top of the mountain. Each time we tried to focus on one, it would vanish. This freaked us out a little. There were three of us in the tent, and we all saw them. We chalked it up to our mind playing tricks on us since we were exhausted, and we've been taking turns trying to beat the Slenderman game. But we said it was best to ignore them and go to sleep. We were probably just out of our minds, trying to make us think there was something there. But who knows? I've seen some scary stuff in my life, and even my father has some scary stories from his childhood growing up in the southern Idaho desert. I guess... I'll never know for sure. I found some cheap train tickets to Luxembourg, and being the adventurous person I am, decided to book last minute and go all by myself. Due to some unfortunate and lack of planning circumstances, I ended up on that train to Luxembourg with nothing to wear for the weekend except the clothes on my back. I figured it was no big deal. How boring would it have been for everything to have gone according to plan? Anyway, 
Luxembourg City is quite small, and after two days I had pretty much seen most of what I wanted to see. A quick Google search showed me that there was a beautiful forest some kilometers north of the city. I thought it looked perfect, so I bought a day train pass and set out on my journey. I managed to make it there, and it was gorgeous. I wasn't really dressed for hiking since I had no clothes or shoes with me at the time but didn't want to miss out on such an amazing experience. So I ventured into the forest anyway. I was wearing shorts and a t-shirt and ballet flats for shoes. I told myself I'd stay close to the area and not do any crazy rock climbing or anything and nothing would go wrong. Boy, was that a dumb assumption to make. I was about 45 minutes away from where I started walking. There was no one else around and I walk along a sharp turn, and there's a lady walking towards me. She was probably 45 or so, and seemed quite plain. As we approached each other, she suddenly says, That's not okay. I ignore this, as I try to ignore people on the street as much as possible, and continue walking. She has reached the point of being right next to me now, and as she passes, she says, You can't do this. There's no one else around. So she has to be talking to me. I reluctantly turn towards her and ask, Pardon me? She says, How dare you show up here like this? I think she has me confused for someone else. I offer her an apology and continue, but she follows. Don't you understand? You're ruining it. I say nothing. What the hell am I supposed to say? I see some big branches close by that I could perhaps use as a weapon if I need to. I don't even know what's going on at this point. She's screaming now, repeating it's all sacred and my shoes are ruining the sacredness of the forest. I stand my ground, offer one more apology, and she tells me I'm going to regret it. I don't know why, but I told her that I had nothing else to wear, trying to justify myself, I suppose. Then she tells me it doesn't matter. I'm starting to feel relieved. Maybe she'll leave me alone. The forest is protected. Do you know who protects it? She says. No. Realistically, where can I run? Nowhere. Who can I call? No one. So I have to face this lady at all times. I don't want her attacking me from behind or something. She proceeds to tell me that Jesus Christ is protecting the forest. I nod. Sounds about right. She repeats that it doesn't matter to her anymore that I'm wearing ballet flats. She then says that Jesus and God know, since she told them. She tells me that God will not let me leave the forest. Pardon? And she tells me slowly that God knows I have forsaken the forest and that I am a traitor and a sinner. She tells me that I'm not going to make it out and that I will never leave. God will never let me. That he sees me here, ruining the sacredness of the forest. And he sent her to find me, that I had my chance. And that he will dish out the punishment that I deserve. I nod. I'm kind of scared, but at least she has left it up to God to punish me. So I should be safe. I just need her to walk away. We hold eye contact for a long 45 seconds, and then she turns and carries on. I stay where I am, slowly back up into a tree, and wait while I watch her leave. I was afraid she had some nearby friends so I wanted my back up against something to make me feel safer. She was still within earshot when I heard her say, He won't let you leave. You know nothing you can do can change that. She kept walking and never turned back. I waited 15 minutes with my back to that tree, then slowly kept going and never saw her again. Religious fanatic in the Mullethal Forest Let's not meet again.
every summer, I go to this camp deep in Pennsylvania called French Creek Bible Camp. I was with the grade 11 to 12 age group. There's been many stories passed around over the years about evil creatures living in the woods. One was called the Goatman. He was described to be like the devil himself, having red eyes. Some claimed to have seen him, but I did not believe them. There used to be five different sleeping areas at this camp, three for guys and two for girls. But a few years ago, sleeping area five burnt to the ground one night while people were camping there. No one is sure how the fire started because the cabins do not have electricity and fire officials said it wasn't a forest fire that caused unit five to burn. This was already strange enough. Now I was in Unit 4, the furthest away from civilization. One night, our cabin door swung wide open and crashed against the wall, as if someone kicked in our door. But we shined a flashlight outside and investigated, and saw nothing. We told some people the next morning, but we didn't think much of it. Keep in mind, the weather was not at all windy. Was this a sign we shouldn't be here? Now, this is where stuff got intense. It was the second to last night before we were supposed to go home. Once again, the weather was calm. It was around 2.30 a.m. and my entire cabin was awoken to the loud sound of our wooden door being slammed open. Moments later, we hear a loud cracking noise and I notice the large tree next to our cabin is falling towards us. I believe in the split second I looked out the window and at the tree falling, I saw a dark figure fleeing the area. The tree fell onto our cabin and crashed through the roof onto my cabin mate's bed. If I had not looked out the window, he would have been crushed by the weight of the tree and or the ceiling falling. This tree was very large, at least a hundred feet tall, and everyone in the surrounding area came to see what happened and made sure that we were all okay. We looked at the tree, and it was cut cleanly across the bottom, as if someone cut it with a chainsaw. But we were so close to the tree, that we would have heard someone sawing it, so that's impossible. I truly believe someone or something was trying to get rid of us or punish us that night. Needless to say, I had my mum take me home right away and have not been back since. This happened to my grandfather in the late 50s. He went camping with some of his buddies and his then girlfriend, my now grandmother. They were out in the middle of nowhere. Back then there were far more undeveloped areas and it was pristine wilderness and very deep where they were going. They came across a clearing, not too far in, and decided to make their camp there. They got all their stuff and started building their camp. They were roasting food over the fire, drinking a few beers, and generally having a good time. It's quiet, too quiet. All the noises in the forest had suddenly stopped. Everyone seems to have taken notice. They look around and can't see anything peculiar. It was still daylight. It was around 8 p.m. But there was nothing to give any indication that something was wrong. They look around for a little while, seeing if there's anything in the tree line. But after waiting around and seeing nothing, they continue chatting and try to forget about it. That night, they fall asleep. The chirping and the animal sounds have come back to some degree, but not like it was before, and everyone is a little bit on edge. My grandfather and grandmother are sharing a tent, and of their friends, one of them goes to pee. They get out of the tent, walk away, and are not heard from in several hours. My grandfather wakes up in the middle of the night, also to pee. And as he's walking out, 
through the dim embers left in the fire, does he see a lump on the ground that wasn't there before. He darts over, and it's his friend. He's quietly sobbing to himself on the floor. My grandpa shakes him and asks him what's wrong. He's just mumbling, incoherent babble. So he tries to take him into his tent and gets him to sleep. The next morning, everyone wakes up and goes for breakfast. The friend is still in the tent. And when they wake him up and try to talk to him, he reveals something horrifying. He went out to pee in the night when he heard someone calling his name from down the forest. He went down to see who it was, thinking it was another one of the party who'd perhaps gone in a bit further to do their business and maybe were lost, seeing them in the dim embers of the light of the fire. But the further he went down, the more he realized that this person or this voice was getting further away. He started shouting to them, telling them that they were getting further away and to stay put. There was no reply. As he got further in, he heard someone almost behind him whisper, nearly there. He turned around and there was nothing there. He ran as fast as he could, but tripped up on a vine and smashed his face to the ground. Although there was no cuts or bruisings, he crawled his way up the top and reached our campsite and was huddled over just recovering in the dark for a few seconds, trying to lie low to not be seen by whatever it was. That's when my grandfather found him. He says that for the rest of the night, he stayed up until he passed out, listening, hearing the voice in the woods occasionally call out his name. Roger, Roger, I'm waiting. He never went camping again. My grandfather swears this story's true, as the look on Roger's face was one of absolute terror. And there's no way that this honest, hardworking man would ever make something up like that. They didn't go camping again. About three months ago, my wife, then fiance and I, were driving from Oregon to Arizona. We were in a part of Nevada that was in the middle of nowhere. We were on the end of a 70 mile stretch with no cell service at midnight. My wife is a small girl, only five foot one and a hundred pounds. I often joke when I go to see her at work, oh, it must be take your child to work day. She's that small. It was my wife's turn to drive at this point. So I was reclined in my seat, out of view, sleeping. She shakes me awake and says, this guy's been following me on my ass for a while. I don't know what his issue is. I glance behind to see a big, F-350, only about 10 feet behind us. I tell her to speed up, figuring he was just wanting us to go faster, but he keeps the same distance from us at all times. All of a sudden, he shoots into the oncoming lane, overtakes us, and then proceeds to slow in front of us, bringing his and our speed to only 10 miles an hour. She backs off a considerable distance when he slams on his brakes and starts opening his door. At this point, I sit up all the way. I am a pretty big guy and I roll my window down. When he spots me, he slams his door shut and takes off. I'm not one to jump to conclusions, but I feel that the guy didn't see me. He would have definitely tried to take my wife. It shook us up pretty badly. And at the next gas station, we found the attendant and called it in. Luckily, 
I got his plate numbers. And that's why you don't drive in the middle of the night, in the middle of nowhere. You never know who is out there. Nothing has made me not want to go back into the woods, but I've had some strange experiences and seen some disturbing stuff. I've walked into two marijuana grows and into one still sight. I backed away slowly from all three. The marijuana sites were strange because it took me a minute to realize what I was seeing. When you're picking your way through fairly thick vegetation, a plant is a plant until it isn't. I did have an unexplained sitting of a creature about seven years ago. I'm not sure what that was. I'm trained in animal identification by tracks, scat, and sight. It honestly looked a lot like the Bigfoot you hear about in stories. I actually was walking into a spot where I duck hunt. It had snowed several days before and had frozen slash thawed a few times. So there was a really thick crust on the snow. I'm a big guy and could easily walk on top without breaking through. As I walked along a farm path, I heard something in the forest to my right. Looking, I noticed a shape maybe 30 yards away, trying to hide behind a pine tree. I could see it clearly. It kept sliding to the left and peering out around the tree trunk. I stopped and it turned and ran away downhill, crossed the upper end of a frozen beaver pond, breaking through the ice, and crossed an open field on the other side and disappeared into the woods. I lost sight of it before it broke through the ice, and it scared me. Shaking, I drew my pistol and made my way back into the field on the far side of the beaver pond and looked at the muddy tracks where it came out of the water. They were just smudges. It wasn't even denting the packed frozen snow. I went down to the water to look at the broken ice. It was thick enough for me to stand on, and I tried it. I went back to the tree that it was trying to hide behind. There was a limb that was across its face, so I knew I could get a height estimate. That limb was even with the top of my head. When I was standing, where it would have stood. I'm six foot. So that thing would have at least been six foot six or more. What was it? It was bipedal, stood at least six foot six. Maybe it was a person. What could possibly make a human cross a frozen pond in cold 10 degrees Fahrenheit weather, not knowing if the ice would support them or even how deep the water was? Then, where did this now very wet person go into a 300 acre forest? There is still a logical explanation. I just don't know what it is. I live in Utah. I went hiking up the Bonville shoreline trail that used to be the shore of Lake Bonville ages ago. This day, I picked a different trail to follow, one I had never been on before. After hiking for a few miles up this trail, I came around a bend and I see true trees that had apparently been uprooted or fallen, and they were placed over the trail in a way that made it look like an archway. That by itself wasn't weird, but there were two big elk skulls placed on the end of each tree, placed just so that the empty eye sockets of the skull were looking directly at you as you passed under the trail. I thought that was kind of weird, but you know, whatever. Probably just some people thinking they're funny. I shrugged it off and kept going. But as soon as I passed through the threshold of the archway, a cold chill shot up my spine and I felt my hackles rise instantly and goosebumps all over my body. I kept going for a little while because I didn't want to go back yet. 
but the whole time I was walking, I couldn't shake the sensation that I was being watched. It had me feeling really tense. I walked for a good 10 minutes before I decided to turn around. As I'm walking back, maybe five minutes later, it gets real quiet very suddenly. All of the birds stopped chirping. All of the little animals around stopped moving. It even seemed like the wind died down at that moment too. Total silence. My dad was a real big hunter when I was younger. So I'm very familiar with the idea that sudden quiet in the wilderness is generally bad news. By this point, I had a white knuckle grip on the hilt of my big survival knife as I kept walking down the trail. I passed through the archway again and honestly broke into a full on sprint. I didn't see anything, but there was something there. I was being stalked. I could feel the eyes still even as I ran down the trail. I haven't been back to that trail since that day. I don't know what it was that was stalking me, but there was something there and I don't want to find out what it was. The following stories are from an uncle on my mother's side. He's a considerably conservative man in his approach to most things, from political to taste in film, as he generally considers any cinema post 1950s to be absolute garbage. And I feel I should mention his disdain for the genres of horror and science fiction in entertainment before I continue. That said, I was surprised when a few years ago, I made a passing comment regarding alien abduction. For the life of me, I have no idea what prompted this. And he spoke seriously and mentioned two encounters of his own. He seemed excited to share the stories and enjoyed me listening to them. The first took place inside of a flat he rented in the mid 80s. The location was Stretford Road, Manchester, UK. Apparently, my uncle looks out of his bedroom window when a flying saucer appears directly opposite and sits still in the air. There are a row of windows separating the top and bottom of this saucer and inside are the shapes of people moving around. The saucer idles for around 10 seconds and then completely disappears. To this day, he claims the story to be genuine. Then, around the mid 80s, somewhere in Manchester, UK, my uncle used to be a mechanic. He was working at a friend's car at home and needed a particular part as the one he's looking at is severely damaged. He takes the part to another garage, hoping to negotiate price on a replacement and asks the only guy working there if he has one. The guy smiles, takes the part from my uncle and then returns 10 seconds later with the same part and one completely identical. By identical, I mean that my uncle described it as a duplicate of the original, damaged in the exact same places with the same blemishes and tells. Confused, my uncle takes the part from the mechanic and as he studied them, the mechanic bursts into hysterics. Thinking it's a prank, my uncle calls Bull and asks where he got the part, to which the mechanic replies that he made it. My uncle left the shop with both parts, dumbfounded as how the mechanic had produced the identical part. Without reason, my uncle insists that this mechanic was an alien or something otherworldly. But I always thought his mind was tilted towards this explanation as per his alleged saucer experience. As for a possible explanation, it makes sense that car parts would be subject to similar examples of damage and perhaps the mechanic in question noticed my uncle's part looked uncannily similar to one of his own and saw room for a prank. Certainly explains the laughter. I'll have to apologize 
for the sparsity of detail in this one. I regret it was hard to find these out. I always thought of this story as its best to be weird, and at its worst to be casually explainable. As most teenagers are, I was pretty reckless with my own safety. I knew about people being taken and people being killed, but I thought I was invincible and doubted anything would ever happen to me. At the same time, I was quite receptive, paranoid and aware of my surroundings, just not educated enough. Being this naive comes with its fair share of dangerous situations. From ages 12 to 17, I preferred to go out in the dark. It felt more exciting. I would frequently go out for long walks with my best friend, who is a year younger than me. And if I wasn't with her, I'd tell my mom I was, so that she wouldn't worry. We never really had specific destinations. I just loved to walk. And at the later stages, despite my previous experiences, I would walk town to town, frequenting particular benches or deserted places. Stupid, I know. This experience I shared with my friend when I was around 14 and her 13. One of our regular daytime spots was a well-known area of my town, hard to miss. Huge chalk hills and woods with miles of fields and farm. A very strange sight amongst the businesses, homes, council estates, miles of roads and shopping centers surrounding. As you can imagine, a beautifully quiet place to visit, to get away from the rush and mounds of other humans, and instead watch it from afar. It tended to only be dog walkers and the occasional jogger that frequented these areas, and apart from teenage parties, which were few and far between in this area of the hills, I'd never heard of much crime occurring here. One evening, we walked to a park we liked to chill in. I cringe thinking about this place too. It was huge and fenced in behind lines of houses and was locked at a certain time each night. It was the most remote and lesser known park in an area that had many of a similar size, mostly due to being hard to find and it held an even lesser known passage to the hills. We hung around in the park for a bit in the darkness of winter, got bored and decided that we would go for a stroll across the fields, maybe even try to get into our little den that we had built there one summer, for some much desired adrenaline. From past experiences going with groups, there were rarely ever people there after dark. Probably because it wasn't very well lit. We took the path and joked around on the field under the hills, wandering around, when we noticed a short, stocky man with a limp in the distance. I instantly got a strange feeling about him, and it wasn't my usual fight-or-flight anxiety I got with your regular human. It was pure, get your little ass down that path and to somewhere safe anxiety. He seemed to stop, and turn around and walk a bit, and then turn back towards us and walk a bit closer, then change his mind over and over, and then he stopped again and turned towards us, and as if on a mission, headed in our direction. We headed straight for the path. We started slow, nervously giggling, and looked behind ourselves and realized this man was really gaining, despite his limp. It just didn't feel right at this point, so we ran. We ran through the unlit park, which at this point had multitude of bats flying across, just to add to the allure of it. And we looked behind us. He was still following. 
When we were at the gate exiting, he just started to cross the grass. Now this wasn't the only way to the main road. It was muddy and dark and occasionally locked. But in our worry, I don't even think that crossed our minds. Looking back, most rational thinking adults probably wouldn't go this way behind two little girls. They'd follow the path that went around the outside one instead. We went this way because to us it seemed the quickest and already in an unsafe situation. It didn't seem as dangerous as this stranger catching up. We ran down the road, crossed the traffic lights and slowed down. We were next to a pub so we felt safe. We rationalized it. I mean, it could be a coincidence, as he was just walking in the same direction as us. But at the same time, we still wanted to get home without him knowing where we lived. So we continued forward at a fair pace. Again, looking back as we walked, this man was still staggering after us, and he looked tired. Why didn't he slow down or stop? Nothing added up. We were down a dark, empty road, and were unnerved once again. It was about three quarters of a mile until we got to some 24-hour shop, so we decided we would run it. The sooner we were around with other people, the better. We just about made it to a shop, hid behind a passport photo machine, and looked towards the road where we'd left the man behind. In these few seconds, I felt rational again, and imagined that he would just continue his rushed walk all the way to his home. But instead, he stopped at the crossing and inspected the roads. He was looking for us, and looked every way we could have gone. He was searching for something, and it certainly wasn't a car. He decided on a street, and as fast as he could drag his dodgy leg, he attempted to trail after us. Me and my mate were shaken. We couldn't understand why he was following us, but we knew that he almost certainly was. After a few minutes, we decided to try and confirm what was happening, and peeked down the road he went down. We could see him clearly annoyed, looking down each side road and turning in circles, desperately looking for a sign of where we went. We left him there, and hurried home in the opposite direction, only taking the main roads. The next day at school, we told the story to our friends at lunchtime, and everyone agreed it was weird. He must have followed us at least one and a half miles in the end, which was a long distance. Just for comical value, although reasonably irrelevant, I'll add that just as lunch ended, a janitor with a strikingly similar limp and of same body type walked into the cafeteria. Myself and my friends just looked at each other, and for a short while, convinced ourselves that it was him. We still talk about it now, and wonder what his intentions were. I wonder more about what he would have done if he had caught up to us at the shops or pub. I most likely now think he was just trying to scare us, either because that made him feel something, or because he wanted us to not endanger ourselves like that again. But I think that just might be my naivety shining through. I can't say I was a lot more careful after that experience, but I am glad to still be here, and much more educated and aware now. All I can say is, I never went back to those hills after dark, and wouldn't recommend it either. I was in Denali National Park two years ago, with my now wife and two other friends. If you aren't familiar with it, it is a trailless wilderness. That means that there aren't trailheads or marked trails. And if you find social or game trails, you are encouraged to avoid them to keep the wilderness as pristine as possible. 
you give a backcountry permit to a unit, which is a large division of the park and has a limited number of campers in it. You get on the bus that goes to one of the roads through the park and drops you off when it is going through access to your assigned unit. Then it drives away and you're in the middle of nowhere. It is amazing and intimidating at the same time. Anyway, we backpack for two amazing days and have yet to see any wildlife other than the local ptarmigans. On the morning of the last night, the others are drinking coffee and we are preparing to break camp. I'm looking down in the river valley that our campsite has a view of. We hadn't seen other humans for 48 hours, and I think I see some campers hiking through the brush in the distance. I call out, and the hikers turn out to be a bull moose who pops his head up and looks at us. We then start watching him, and he walks along the river and slowly makes his way towards our camp. He's not coming here, I say to the group. Well, he was. He climbed the hill and walked right into our campsite. We gave him a wide berth as he approached, as moose are the only animals you run from in Denali, as they can be aggressive. He froze and eyeballed us for a while, then continued up the side of the mountain. It was scary as hell, but he was a majestic beast. Anyway, it starts pouring on us as we are finishing breaking camp, and we decide to save some time by following a game trail for a bit, as we were soaked and cold. This saved us a lot of time bushwhacking through alders and whatnot. Well, we round a corner, and the trail comes to a dead end, in what was the remains of a bear kill site. The bones of a moose, flattened down brush, old scat. Let me tell you, that's an unnerving feeling. We freeze, the blood drains out of our faces, and we look at each other and instantly agree to double back a bit and start our bushwhacking again to get out of Dodge. It was an epic trip, and I highly recommend it if you have any backpacking experience. If not, camp near the ranger station is also nice to do some day hikes. A bit of backstory before I start this. I live in northern British Columbia, Canada, and a couple of years back, my friend had invited me to come with him, his mum, and his sister to a resort by a lake, an hour and a half or so out of town. This was at the end of June and the beginning of July. This so-called resort wasn't exactly what I anticipated. It's a main log building where you check in, but it's also a restaurant too. A few log cabins and some spots down by the lake for RVs and stuff to park in. There's a highway that you turn off of onto the lot where the check-in building is. And to the right of the highway is the forest for miles, as well as everywhere else around that area. The only thing that stands out is the highway, which cuts through the woods. Around the lake, there's some houses and whatnot. But generally speaking, if it isn't a long weekend, there aren't too many people out there. The cabins and RVs area are separated and away from the main building, about a five to eight minute walk away. A little bit past the main building, there's a clearing where you could sit at a couple of tables that look like they haven't been used in about 10 years, as there are vines and grass that have grown around them. And about 10 feet into the woods past those tables, there are two small lagoons surrounded by an old wire fence. The lagoons and table area are important for later. We got there in the evening, unloaded the car, got acquainted with the log cabin, which was really nice by the way, and then we went out to explore around. Not too many interesting things happened on our first day, 
as we didn't explore a whole lot before dark. Skip to the next day, and it's cloudy and rainy, which we actually were hoping for, as that meant that there were very few people at the resort, and we would get free rain over it. We explore down by the lake and around the cabin area more thoroughly, and eventually make our way up to the clearing where the tables are located. We look at the tables and see that they haven't been touched in what looks like a long time from the amount of grass and weeds that has built up around it. And while investigating, I took notice that around 50 feet or so into the backwoods, there was what looked to be a clear area. We slid down into this ditch-like area, which was probably around eight foot difference in elevation from the nearest table area, and trampled through the brush. We eventually came to the spot, which we're pretty sure are lagoons due to the way they're constructed. We noticed there was a wire fence around it. We walked around the area planning to leave until we saw what looked like a spot where a large animal had walked over the fence and crushed a portion of it. Not really paying attention to the fact that a large animal may have been in the area, we dismissed those thoughts and said that it was probably bent like this for a long time. We tooled around the area looking at the lagoons and eventually we left, planning to come back the next day with big rocks to throw into the water as it was getting time to eat dinner. But the next day, we came back to the tables, planning to go into the lagoon area once again. But before we had a chance to go down the ditch, we stopped because of a noise. This is what triggered the rest of the events in this story. The noises we heard were those of walking over small twigs snapping them in the lagoon slash ditch area we had traveled the previous day. Keep in mind, those footsteps weren't there before. We stuck around for about 10 minutes or so, until we got hit with an intense feeling of dread. After this, we said screw this, and went back to our cabin where we played poker for the rest of the night. While playing, we discussed the events that had taken place and eventually laughed it off, saying it was probably just a bear passing through, or rabbits in the area. The next day it was raining heavily, and much darker than the past couple of days. We left our cabin and planned to go into the lagoon area later, but we wanted to chill around a medium forested area close to the cabins that I forgot to mention at the beginning of this story. As I previously said, after we had originally gone into the lagoon area, things started getting weird. We were messing around in the woods, breaking big sticks on trees, when we had heard what sounded to be someone doing the same thing about 200 feet away in the direction we were facing. It was hard to judge how far exactly it was because of the way the forest carries sound, but it was pretty far in front of us. We wouldn't have cared too much about this until we took notice of where it actually was. The entire area around there and beyond is all forested. And having someone in those forests along with us that far in and in the less than favorable weather with very few people at the resort at that time is unlikely. We decided to leave the area and come back later during the evening. Spoiler alert, that wasn't a great idea. So after leaving that area, we went around to the lagoon area and listened for a few minutes. We couldn't hear anyone walking, so we assumed that we were right about it being a passing forest creature. Not even 10 steps in, and I tell my friend to stop moving. We both stop and listen. We hear what sounds like the steps again, but as they're coming in louder and faster, we get that same overbearing feeling of dread. We hightail it out of there, spooked as hell, and we book it back to our cabin. Later that evening, we returned to the forest clearing from earlier 
where we had heard the branch against the tree noise in the day. We again started smacking branches against trees, this time not hearing anything. But as I turned to my left, something caught my eye. There was what appeared to be a person standing behind a tree, and I saw them duck behind it when they noticed that I noticed them. I nearly crapped myself as I yelled to my friend that we needed to get out of there, and we sprinted back into the cabin. We returned the next day, and I took a picture of where the figure was standing. Later that night, while we're sitting in the loft area where our beds are, we have a discussion about what happened that day. There's much less joking this time, and we're trying to make sense of what happened. We started with the branch hitting the tree noise. At first, we tried to dismiss it by saying it was an echo, but remembered that the echoes weren't prominent at the time, especially five seconds after hitting the tree. Only I saw the hooded figure in the same area later, but I knew it was a person, or at least think it was a person. We weren't too sure about that, so we moved on to talking about the lagoon slash table area. Nothing really too interesting came up in that conversation. We left the next day as our booking had ended. This isn't the end of the story, however. We came back last year around the same time, but we had brought another friend with us. We showed him around and briefed him about what had happened the previous year and he took it with a grain of salt, as any sane person would. This eventually changed over the next three days. The activity this time wasn't so much in the side forest where I'd seen the hooded figure, and where me and my friends heard the tree noises, although we did hear the returning knocks again, but in the lagoon slash table area. I'll skip to the juicy stuff. So after showing our other friend the lagoon area, we decided to enter it after not hearing any noises. All went well, and we returned the next day. This time the footsteps were there once again, but a bit closer than before. We left that area, but returned around an hour later. We were determined to see what was repelling us out of there. But to get in, we had to be quiet. Slowly, we went down the ditch, and to the lagoons without anything hearing us. And we didn't see anything there. We heard something snap a little bit away. So without making too much noise, we got out of there. The next and final day before we had to leave once again, we returned to the table slash lagoon area, where we were planning to go to the lagoons again. But when we were at the table area, we had heard something new. It was a sort of screeching noise, but it sounded like a person almost. At first, we thought it was a person who had injured themselves and was calling for help. But I made everyone stop and just listen before doing anything. We listened to it. And from what I heard, it sounded like a mixture between a person yelling, an angry cat hissing, and a shallow dog bark. My two friends decided that they wanted to get closer and investigate the sound while I was opposed to it. We went regardless, but I stayed much further away as my gut was telling me to get out of there. We threw rocks near the area from where the sound was in hopes to flush it out of its hiding spot. And when that didn't work, we got much too close. We were right at the edge of a ditch close to the tables and when I got as close as my friends did, something happened. The thing that was making the sound had thrown either a large log or had knocked down a tree, judging by the sound. But I didn't exactly stick around to investigate. I turned tail and bolted down as fast as my legs would carry me. I was probably about 15 feet away from my friends as my danger reflexes were faster, and it registered to me faster that I needed to get the hell out of there. We were about a hundred feet away when we came to a stop. Nothing came after us, but the sounds then resumed. We walked around the main building 
and when we came around, there was a black bear standing there. We let out a sigh of relief, as we thought we had been spooked by a bear. But then we shifted back to our previous feelings of dread, when the bear did the same thing as us, and got out of there as fast as it could. We didn't investigate further, and ran back to our cabin. Nothing further happened as we left the following day, due to the reservation being over. I don't know what the lagoon slash table creature is, but I sure as hell know it's not any bear. The other thing in the forest, I'm still not sure about. I think that they're separate things, as the woodsman, or tree knocker as we've nicknamed it, is more elusive and seems to be luring us into that area. While the screecher is very territorial and aggressive, I've tried to find things online about similar experiences in the area, but I've come up empty, which is another reason why I'm sharing this. Does anyone have any ideas about what this could be? I have no clue what's going on. Despite the strange things going on there, the location is very beautiful. The cabins are nice despite the spring beds, and the food at the restaurant is also quite tasty. The place is called Purden Lake Resort. If you look it up on Google, it's the one with the green roof. I hope you enjoyed the story. My mum's family used to live in the countryside in the northern region of Colombia. It was the late 70s or early 80s. I don't know exactly when. My grandpa had his own farm. He wasn't a big landowner though, but he owned a small farm in the middle of the Serrania. He has worked since he was 11 years old because my great grandfather died when he was just a kid. During all his teenage years, he learned everything related to farming, how to tame horses, herd cattle, grow plants and whatnot. And he was indeed very knowledgeable on agriculture, since they lived amidst the dense jungle. It was normal to hear witches laughing or whistling, and hearing the screams of La Llorona. Not only that, it was a tight-knit community. Everyone knew each other, and knew each other's business. My grandpa used to work for the big landowners of the region. However, there was one he always refused to work with. It was an extremely wealthy landowner. He had a number of heads of cattle, horses, and it was said that he also had thousands of hectares of land where he cultivated rice, potatoes, yams and cassava. There was a rumor going around that this guy got all his possessions overnight by making a deal with the devil. Locals wouldn't work for him. Most people who did were unsuspecting foreigners who ignored the whole story. They were seduced by the high wages they were offered compared to those that they would have made if they'd have worked anywhere else. Most of the foreigners learned quickly about the boss's wrongdoings. But if we take into account that Colombia back then was even more of a shithole than it is today, what other option did they have? It was that, or perish from starvation. Everyone was aware that one of the clauses of the deal was that the landowner had to sacrifice the life of one of his employees and give his soul to the devil. Every single year, at around the same time, August, they would find one of his workers dead near the river every year. And as you might think, this couldn't last forever. And the landowner's luck came to an end when all his employees started to quit. They moved to the main cities, found other jobs with other landowners. And this in part was also triggered by the guerrillas and gangs forcing people from their homes. The landowner suddenly found himself completely alone. He couldn't find anyone to take care of his crops or cattle, 
So he started to sell everything but his mansion. And then August came. My grandpa and uncles told me that it was a horribly gloomy day and that that night a huge storm, the likes of which they had never seen before, broke into their area. They heard deafening thunders and dreadful screams of agony that made their houses rattle and saw horrendous lightning illuminating the pitch black skyline. Everything ceased at 3 a.m. so they could barely catch up on sleep that night. Once the sun rose in the morning, everyone started their usual day. But that same day, they were told that the landowner had been murdered. The whole town then rushed to his mansion, and what they found was so gruesome and spine-chilling that up to this day, it sends shivers down their spine. The landowner was strapped to an oak tree, beheaded, and his entire body seemed to have been split in half with a saw. People who talked to him during his last days said that he was going crazy, and he often talked about a fight with the devil. Therefore, everyone thinks that the landowner challenged the devil to a duel to the death, and he literally got smashed to pieces. At the time of this story, I was going through a bad breakup. Turns out that one of my best friends had been having an affair with my now ex-girlfriend. If this has happened to anyone, you know the feeling of being crushed, not only by your partner, but by your closest and most trusted friend. I have always been a bit of a loner, and so the few friends I had I cherished, and this was a truly crushing blow for me. I sort of lost it for a while. I just kind of went off the radar, packed all my things quietly one evening, drove to my parents' house, and broke down. It wasn't a pretty sight. I don't know how she could have done that to me. But whatever, that's in the past now. In an attempt to heal my very breaking and aching heart, I started taking long walks at night. It would give me time to think and smoke and just generally chill. I found it very hard sleeping, my mind always racing. So instead of fighting a losing battle, I just wore myself to the point where I would pass out at about 4 a.m. It was better that way. But onto the story. There's these woods near my parents' house. As a kid, I never really went into them. Picked up some pretty creepy vibes from them before, but as an adult, with not much to lose, I felt like it was time to explore these creepy woods. And what better time than between 1 and 3 a.m., of course. I'd always have my phone on me as a flashlight, although the battery did drain quite quickly. But there was usually enough moonlight out so that I would be able to see my way through the woods. The canopy was by no means thick, and with the street lights dotted about in the distance, you could just about make out this trail. I had been walking through the woods for about a month now, starting to feel better about my situation and coming to terms with the fact that an eight-year relationship had come to an end, and that there are far better ways to spend my time than moping about all of this. That's when, for the first time ever, I heard something. It sounded like footsteps. This was odd. After about a month of walking in the woods, I had never heard a single soul behind me this late at night. Chills ran down my spine, and something inside me told me that I didn't want to be seen. So I quietly turned off my flashlight and crept behind a tree. I sat down and listened. At first, the sound was muffled, but as it came closer, it was very clearly boots stomping their way forward, almost like a march. 
I peeped from my position on the tree, and what I saw gave me chills. There was a figure. They were wearing revolutionary style clothes, and they just marched on, kind of illuminated by the moonlight, but definitely translucent. My eyes followed the grey spectral figure as it walked through the woods. It got to a point where it simply vanished. In the films, they make it that they become puffs of smoke or stuff like that. But this was not the case. The spectre was there one second, and then simply was not the next. Now, as someone who had been walking this trail for a month, and who genuinely couldn't sleep, I can assure you all I was not fatigued in imagining this. If anything, the adrenaline surging through me had caused me to become more awake than I had ever been, on one of these walks anyway. And I sat there, waiting for about 20 minutes in case the figure showed up again. I slowly brushed the dead leaves off my butt and strode onwards towards the house. I got back home, and now my mind was plagued with other thoughts. What the hell did I just see? I didn't sleep that night, and the next night, for the first time ever, I managed to get a good night's rest, as things had been put into perspective a little bit more. I'm almost grateful. Seeing that figure helped me get over a bad breakup. So, to the ghost who I saw that night, if you're out there, thank you for your service. My house is on the biggest chunk of property in the tri-state area, about 108 acres, and was originally kind of a park, but wasn't supposed to be used as a park. Unfortunately, people from all over didn't get the memo that we had moved in, and therefore continued to party, hunt, and fish whenever they felt like it. Over the years, these problems began to go away, except for a couple. Before we talk about the perpetrators, or at least the leader, we should discuss what was behind the property, an asylum, mostly housing psychopaths, schizophrenics, and those who have suffered mental breakdowns. It isn't rare to hear random screaming for no reason coming from over there. There were four men who kept coming back and hunting in the middle of the night. We let some people hunt in the night on Saturday nights, but for the most part hunting was off limits. We were never able to catch these four middle-aged men who always wore masks. I mention that because their leader wore a creative mask, an especially frightening kind of mask. Most of the time he bore a pig mask. These men were sneaky, they were smart, and that's what made them scary. I had three encounters with them, the first being in June of last year. A few friends and I had decided to go on an adventure through the woods, and we discovered something frightening. We had a fortress covered in beer cans with a chair at the top. Being the teenagers we were, we decided the smartest thing to do was to destroy all of the hunter's hard work by kicking the entire fortress down. Boy, did we mess up. We later returned to that fortress to check up on it, and that's when it got scary. It was rebuilt almost as a shrine to the last one, and spray painted around it was, try that again, we dare you. The second encounter happened during a simple walk at night. Sometimes when I get upset, I like to take walks through the woods. This time was at night and it just so happened our favourite hunters were out hunting. I was walking alone, minding my own business, when I see the man in the pig mask and he sees me. He now knows my face, and this becomes important later. I hear a deep laugh, and he turns his gun towards me. I have no idea what he was planning, but I book it out of their ASAP so I didn't have to figure it out. The third and final encounter was the most blood-curdling. It occurred only about a week ago, and I was walking home from my cousin's house in the dark. I had my flashlight shining, 
and I felt safe for once, but something was off. The barn lights were on. They are never on. No one ever goes into the barn. The floors are falling through, and I simply brushed it off as a technical error. But then in the middle of the field, I saw the man in the pig mask, and he saw me. And his words have haunted my dreams since he yelled at me, Get the hell out of here before I make you. The way he said it still frightens me. It was so angry, so vicious, and so dead set on revenge. I haven't been in the woods since then. It was later discovered that in the barn, they had been setting up shop from time to time. So in conclusion, I just want to leave a personal message. To my friend in the pig mask, let's never meet again. Especially not in my woods. My family have a cabin. It's actually a two-story house up in the Appalachian Mountains, but we call it a cabin. We share it with our extended family, and I've got the absolute best memories up there. But the house is nearly 200 years old, and when you're up there all alone, or sometimes in the dead of night, it just feels off. And nearly everyone has experienced some sort of bizarre experience there. The house sits on 350 acres, and one day, my grandfather went out hunting on the property. The sun was just beginning to set when he saw some sort of big black creature sitting near a tree line. It and my grandfather stared at each other and my grandfather fired a shot into the air, hoping to scare it. The creature stood up on its hind legs and walked back into the forest. He said the face was very cat-like, and it had a slinking gait with its long black tail. He was an avid hunter, his whole life, and knew of every kind of creature that lived in those mountains. But he'd never seen such a weird creature as that. And then, a couple of days later, as my immediate family and I were visiting, I saw some weird creature through my bedroom window at night. It looked like an enormous black wolf. When we locked eyes, it ran straight at me, and I instinctively jumped back. When I looked out again, it was gone. But my mum had an experience that chills me to the bone. For some reason, she was spending the night in the room that I usually stay in when I go up there. I don't remember the reasoning for it, but I hadn't joined her on the trip that time. She awoke in the middle of the night to a strange tapping noise against the hardwood floor. She stayed absolutely still and listened as the tapping turned to what sounded like claws scraping against the floor. They started from one end of the room, travelled across the floor under the bed she was sleeping in, and ended in front of the closed closet door. She was on her side facing the closet, but she kept her eyes closed and scarcely breathed. She says it was the most terrified she has ever been. Apparently this clawing noise continued off and on throughout the whole night, and she didn't really get any sleep. There was even a moment that it seemed to hesitate next to her bed, and she could feel something staring at her mere inches from her face. So yeah, those are a few of the experiences that I know of that have happened there, but it's such a lovely house, and I have the most fantastic and wonderful memories from there. And I've spent the night in that very same room that my mum had the terrifying experience in many times since even as recently as last weekend, and I've never heard or seen anything while sleeping there. A few years ago, I went camping with my dad, about a quarter mile off the trail. As we were cooking food, a bear baby wanders into our small clearing. We were a bit freaked out, but it was probably more scared of us 
so it wandered away. We left the campsite to hike a bit, and when it started to get dark, we travelled back to our campsite. We realised we hadn't marked it in any way, and spent a while looking for it. We heard some growling, really loud, and freaked. We started to walk on the trail back to the car, with my dad holding onto our only flashlight. We heard a growl closer this time, not super close, but close enough that we started to run. By then, it was pitch black other than the flashlight. As I ran, I heard my dad drop the flashlight. He found it, but only one of the batteries was still in it. I was thinking this definitely felt like a basic horror plot. We ran pretty fast the few miles back to the car and drove home. We came back the next day and searched all day, couldn't find it. We came back the next weekend, still couldn't find it. And the next weekend, my dad went by himself and found it. He brought the stuff home. The tent had claw marks through it, and all the food that we hadn't yet hung in a tree was eaten. I have not been camping since. This experience was legit one of the most terrifying things that's happened to me while walking my dog. And he's done some weird stuff. So back in 2015, I had a choice of getting a dog or getting a smartphone. I'd never had a dog in my life or a decent smartphone come to think of it. And I'd been saving up for a phone anyhow. So naturally I picked the dog. My dad knew a fellow who had a couple of border collies that recently had a litter. So we drove out, the dude gave me the last pup, and enter Bailey. A couple of weeks later, he got his shots, and I started walking him. My parents figured I was going to be hanging out at the local park with my new pup, so I could get him socialized, but no. I chose to take him around the perimeter of a nearby farm to keep the farm dog in him. I'd been sneaking out to this farm for years. The farmer was an old family friend and my uncle had grown up working with him. So I knew if I were ever caught, I would just drop their name. On either side of the farm, there was some thick woodland, which no one had ever given me reason to be wary of they probably should have. So it's a sunny afternoon. It had been pouring down all week and Bailey was itching for a good walk. I take him to the farm at our usual time and we start making our way around the woods on the east side of the farm. Everything is quiet, but Bailey keeps darting away for me to explore. He's a puppy. It's what they do. But of course, I'd been calling his name all the way around the field. We're about halfway past the woods, and I could see the roof of the farmhouse over the next hill. Bailey's been pulling crap out of the bushes all the way along, and I just gave him into trouble for rolling in a pile of fox crap. That's when I heard a man's voice calling my dog's name. Like this dude I didn't even know was calling my dog by name. I knew it wasn't the farmer because I'd met him at family events like barbecues and weddings. So I knew what he sounded like. I go completely silent, but the guy keeps calling my dog. It sounds like he's deep into the woods and maybe moving, but he's calling my dog with such an excited tone in his voice. And that is what creeps me out the most. Bailey, meanwhile, is completely ignoring this guy and sniffing a now flat pile of poop. I'm a tiny 18 year old girl. The most combat experience I have is a month learning Taekwondo when I was 11 and I don't have a mobile phone. If that guy works out where I am, I'm screwed. And if Bailey decides to go after him, I'm double screwed 
because I'm not letting this possible psycho get his hands on my puppy. I can either run to the farm, which isn't too far away, or run back through the fields towards home. I pick up my dog and sprint across the fields. Behind me I hear someone emerge from the woods, but I'm already over the fence and sprinting back home with my puppy tucked under my arm. I get home and tell my mum. She brushes it off as some weird drunk guy. A few weeks later I'm at my uncle's house and the farmer walks in. I had told my uncle what happened, so he brings it up. The farmer asks exactly which woods I'd been close to and that some of his clothes had gone missing from his washing line. He put it down to strong winds, but now he's not sure. I take him and my uncle to the exact spot the next day, and all three of us go in and find a completely wrecked campsite. There's no clothes or anything, but the tent had collapsed in on itself. There's no fire, but there are some empty gas canisters, like the ones you'd use for portable stoves and empty packets of food scattered everywhere. We reported it to the police, but nothing really came of it, except that I got a phone not long after and kept it on me whenever I went out. I live surrounded by the forest, about a mile away from a haunted lake. I have recurring and painfully vivid nightmares of what I always assume are wendigos and skimwalkers staring into my window or coming out of the woods or coming into my home almost weekly. Prior to these, I haven't had any nightmares since I was perhaps seven or eight. I never ever knew of the idea of humanoids before these nightmares began. They're actually the reason I've been researching everything the past few months. I've heard some creepy stuff at night as well. Notably when I'm outside in my hot tub at around 1 to 3 a.m. and can hear large branches snapping closer and closer to my house and scuffled steps. I always assumed it was an animal, but now I'm not so sure. July 13th, 2017. My friends and I went to get ice cream at night. Snapchat says it was around 10 p.m. when the photos were taken. So it was within the 9.30 to 10.30 time frame. I live in a heavily wooded mountainous and desolate area of southern Pennsylvania. I'm actually in the Lycan Loop, an area where humanoids and supernatural creatures are often reported in Pennsylvania. I also live about a half hour away from both Camp David and Raven Rock Mountain. Fun fact. I've been to Camp David, and it's a pretty creepy place. Some believe that humanoids could be due to the government, which is why I've included it. Anyway, we were driving back home from getting ice cream and just having fun, and I decided to take photos of my friends in the back seat. I was probably Snapchatting someone and just sending photos back and forth. I took two photos and in the first one, something creepy appeared in the rear window. I immediately saved it, and looking back at the window, but neither me or my friend in the back could see anything. I took another picture for good measure, but it was no longer there. I took these pictures in total darkness with flash on. I highly doubt this could be some sort of reflection or glare. There's no glares or reflections on any of the windows or any of the photos. In any other circumstances, I take photos like this. I see no glares or reflections. That being said, why is the face so bright and easy to see? Was it just a trick of the phone? A few months back, my girlfriend and I were bored hanging out around the house and spontaneously decided to go out for a hike. We don't go hiking often, but the idea appealed to the both of us. And even though there was only about an hour left of light, 
we figured we had enough time to go and enjoy a hike before it got too dark. We quickly filled up our water bottles and put on the best walking shoes we had and were out of the door driving up into the mountains. Around my area, there are many hiking trails, with the variety of trails increasing as you go up the mountain. We tended to stay around the base of the mountain in the occasional case that we'd do a hike, where most people would still be walking. But we wanted to change things up and progressed further up the mountain road to a trail a friend of mine had mentioned. We kept in mind our time and figured that we could hike for a bit and simply enjoy the new environment and finish up before it got too late. We arrived at the trailhead and see that there were no cars left along the road where the trail commences. We didn't think too much of it though due to the time. We still had a good 45 minutes until dark, so we troopered on. We started walking down a fairly steep hill that then recoups the elevation at the bottom with an equally steep hill that you have to ascend. We reach the top and then it's smooth sailing from there on out. We see a lone coyote off the trails a way off, and some rabbits, and I made a quip about how those rabbits might need to be careful with that coyote lurking around. She playfully hit me for that one. Approximately less than a mile into the trail, we see a large fallen tree that made a bridge over a dried riverbed, and decided to take a rest, climb around on it, and take pictures. We were there for roughly 10 minutes and then resumed hiking. We continue on the trail for a short distance until she hears a rustle in the trees behind us. We stop, mildly spooked, due to the assumed size of whatever made the rustling, but continue on only briefly before she decides she's done and that we need to head back. It's twilight now, so I agree with her, so we turn around and head back to the car. When we made it back to the fallen tree, my shoe had come untied, so I used the trunk to fix my loose laces and look behind us for the first time on the hike, which is uncharacteristic of me, but hey, I was having fun and there was no need to be paranoid. I see a person dressed entirely in black with their hood on. That was a significant distance behind us, walking at a slow, even pace. It wasn't something out of the ordinary, so what if they're wearing black with their hood on? I wear black most of the time, and it's cold out. I shouldn't make assumptions, right? This does trigger me to be more alert, however, and I inform my girlfriend of this person's presence. It's dusk now. We continue on at an intentionally faster pace and go through a winding section of the trail, and I lose sight of the person. When we come around the final bend of the section, I figure that they're far behind us now and that there's nothing to worry about. Sooner than later, the person is behind us again, but significantly closer, probably 50 feet in comparison to 100 feet before. And we had increased our speeds, so this alarmed us. We briskly walked around another bend, and as soon as we had come around it, we book it. It seemed to be a natural reaction on both our parts as we started running without a word to initiate it. We're nearing the trailhead now, with only the hills to deal with. We catch our breaths for a moment, and I turn around again. I see the person seemingly halt in a sprint upon noticing me look back, as if they were trying to uphold the illusion that they were simply walking. At this point I shout, Go! and we sprint down the hill. What little light was left struggled to make its way through the dense trees surrounding us, and the steep hill proved challenging to run down without a clear path to be seen. We stumbled down the hill, almost falling multiple times and slamming our feet onto the rocks and loose brush. But we didn't fall, and we didn't look behind us. We make it to the bottom, but must continue up the initial hill, and then we would have made it out. We persevere up the incline and make it back to our car. I briefly breathe in relief 
as I start my car. Heart pounding and adrenaline racing as I reverse onto the road. The person emerges at the trailhead, apparently breathing heavily. We finally catch a glimpse of him. His hood had fallen off his head, exposing his pale complexion and dead eyes that were only illuminated by a single lantern at the start of the trail. He was holding something in his hand, but it was too dark to see, and I was not interested in sticking around to make out the object. I shift into drive and accelerate as fast as my car could muster, leaving him behind in the dust of the empty side of the road. Night trail dude, let's not meet again. After my family moved from South Mississippi, we spent maybe six months outside Batesville, but we moved to a city just outside of Charlotte. The house we bought, my parents purchased for probably one of the oddest reasons ever. The day we toured the home, the elderly lady that owned it was cooking pasta, and the house had filled with the smell of good homemade tomato sauce. My parents fell in love at that very instant. The house wasn't what you'd consider to be large, being one of those ranch-style homes that was popular in the 70s and 80s. Three bedrooms, two bathrooms, a concrete back patio, half a dozen pine trees of varying age, and a carport rounded out the home. The house itself was sat on maybe a quarter acre of land, kind of on a hill, with a crawl space. First things first, before we go any further, I have done some research into the property. Naturally, as I was 12 at the time and there was no internet, I didn't do it then. But when I started getting into paranormal investigations, I felt that it was a good time as any to look into some of the previous properties where I had experiences. As far as I can tell, the house itself had nothing overly spectacular that happened in it, while the property itself had been part of a subdivision that grew up there in a housing boom in the 70s, while the majority of the houses dated from around that era. There were one or two which were younger, and maybe a handful that were older. The only thing of note, even marginally so, was records of a Civil War Confederate army that passed through the area, but no real major battles there, perhaps a skirmish or two, but nothing substantial. Whatever the case, I couldn't tie any actual deaths to the property itself. Note, I mean the property the house stood on, not the subdivision. That's another story, but I'll get to that presently. When we first moved to the house, it didn't take long to notice some strangeness to it. Feelings of being watched were common, if not regular. There always seemed to be a presence, and one that didn't strike me as being very happy, tied to the living room area. Curiously, my parents would close the hallway door, which opened into the foyer and front door each and every night. That wasn't something they did previously, as any other house that had a similar setup. I never did figure out why they did that, though. Whatever the case, the feeling of being watched seemed to all centre around the living room and the foyer area of the house. My first bedroom was directly adjacent to this, and I started sleeping with my own door closed then. I can't count how many times I would wake at night with the distinct feeling that something was watching me as I slept. Something that didn't want me or my family there. As far as I can remember though, I only ever had one full paranormal sighting, which is to say, I saw something that I can't explain. One Saturday morning while my dad was outside working on his truck in the patio, I sat in front of the TV in the living room watching my cartoons. As I sat there for some unknown reason, I look up at the door that connected to the hallway. I think I heard someone walking past, or maybe sensed something. In either case, as I looked up for a moment, I caught the shape of someone walking past the door. I didn't see a full body, 
but rather a hand in a long jacket with large brass buttons. It was as though someone was swinging their arms as they were walking, and their hand had remained visible for an instant before they walked into the hallway. The hand did not look normal though. Everything was grey, this soft, faded grey that you could kind of see through. Needless to say, I freaked out. I stood up, and without sparing a glance back, I darted off into the carport. My father asked me what happened, and I told him I'd seen someone, or thought I had seen someone walking down the hall. He gave me a funny look, checked the house, and told me to change and go out to play, as it was obvious to him that I'd been inside for far too long. The feelings of being watched never really stopped in the house. They kind of came and went after that, but the overall feeling that I got was that something just wasn't right about that place. Now, as I said, I can't tie anything to the house or property it was on itself, but the land the subdivision was on was another story. Further down from where I lived, there was this deep gully area with this old dirt road that ran into it, and then alongside the creek at the bottom. This area was rather popular among the few kids that lived in the area, with us cutting trails and building forts. One thing that always stood out about this area was at the bottom of the gully, the rusted remains of a wrecked car sat half in the gully and half out. I now know that it was a 1940s era car, but at the same time, all I knew was that it was old and it had been there a while. This car was something weird in its own right. Every kid that lived in the area had stories about it, with the majority of them being that they didn't like standing near it. Where possible, they'd even go out of their way to avoid being close to it. Much like my house, things didn't really feel right there. But at the car wreck site, well, that feeling was jacked up to 11. Everyone had stories of seeing things in those trails too, with my then best friends, Rob and Riley, relating a story of how one day they were chased out of the trails by this weird old guy in overalls, carrying a pipe or something similar. They told me they saw the guy running after them, and once they passed the car, Rob looked back to see this old guy vanish into thin air. Other friends told of this weird girl in an old dress who would sometimes be seen walking along the trails like she was lost. When approached, she would just silently stare at someone before turning and walking deeper into the woods. Those that tried to follow her would end up turned around and usually pop out the trails back where they had started. So naturally, when I started researching my old home, I had to look into the old gully as well. While I didn't find anything substantial that would say, yup, this place is haunted, and here's why, I did turn up a good bit of circumstantial evidence. As with everything, you have to take evidence, especially circumstantial, with a grain of salt. But I do think that this answered some of the questions I had about the area. Granted, it still created more questions, but I'm at least happy with the results. As to the circumstantial evidence, I found that back in the 50s, the property had been largely uninhabited. I say largely because there was something of an exception to this. On the back side of things, across from where the gully was, a house had stood. That home was owned by a family who had owned the property that would later become the subdivision. Most of where the subdivision was had been farmland, while the dirt road followed the curve of the road I lived on before turning and going deeper into the gully area. The road has been cut at some prior point, possibly in the 30s or so, to act as an access road to allow loggers to cull some of the pine trees in the area. However, by the 50s, it was largely out of use, save for a kind of make-out place by local kids. The area being well enough out of the city limits and quiet enough so people wouldn't be disturbed. Sometime around 1956 or 7, the house that owned the property burnt down under mysterious circumstances, 
killing the elderly man who owned the property. The cause of the fire had been arson, though they were never able to figure out who had done it. It is believed, however, that the fire had been started in retaliation for something that had happened a couple of years earlier. Several years earlier, the man who owned the property had found himself in court as a result of some actions he had taken. The record was rather vague on this, but it did note that in trying to scare some kids off his property, there had been an accident that resulted in the death of one young woman. Beyond that, it didn't say much. Whatever the case, the man managed to beat it and returned to his home. Then a few years later, his home burnt down with him inside it. After that, the property remained forgotten, ended up being broken up by several purchases before sometime in the 70s. A development company purchased it and started putting homes on it. What do I think happened there? I've got a couple of theories, but based on everything I remember seeing and knowing of the area, only one thing seems to be likely. Some time between 1950 and 1955, this man's property became a popular makeout place for local teens. This angers the man as the kids are making a nuisance of themselves, vandalizing his property and outbuildings, and just generally annoying him. So one night he takes things into his own hands. The cops really aren't doing much as he's outside the city limits and deputies are taking forever to show up when they show up. So he decides that he's going to either confront the kids or at the very least give them a good scare. He happens upon some kids and starts chasing them in hopes of getting them off his property. When the driver makes a mistake and either hits a tree or simply rolls his car into the gully. This then kills the girl in the car, injures the boy, and causes the man to be charged with being responsible for their deaths. However, he manages to beat the charge, with the death being ruled accidental, and he's not held responsible. The car remains where it's wrecked, due to it being either too difficult to pull out, or just not worth the trouble to recover. Someone tied to the kids, possibly the parents, or the surviving kid himself, takes the law into his own hands and sets the man's house on fire, killing him in the process. The police are pretty much tired of dealing with this guy or just don't look into it too hard and the killer goes unpunished. I think the theory pretty well explains at the very least the experiences we often had on those trails, with Rob and Riley being chased off by the old man's ghost, repeating the same kind of thing he had been known for doing. The girl, on the other hand, was likely the spirit of the one killed in the accident. She may have been cursed to wander simply because the killer was never convicted. Whatever the case, the property is pretty much now gone. Since we lived there in 1986 to 89, the area has been built up further, with the gully area largely being filled in and developed into housing. I do wonder if the people that live there see the spirits from time to time, but I don't have any real way to contact them without looking like some kind of crazy person. Well, now that I live over 3,000 miles away. In the end, I suppose, this is one of those ghost stories that doesn't really have a good ending. Or ever will. Oh, and as to the Batesville thing? Well, Batesville Elementary slash High School used to be well known for a haunting in the gymnasium. The ghost in question was a young girl who was brutally assaulted and eventually killed there, with the case still open as her killer was never caught. It was said that from time to time, people would hear the sound of a girl screaming for help in the back corner of the gym near the bleachers. On inspection though, they wouldn't find anyone. I didn't ever experience the ghost myself though as the murder happened about a year after my family moved. However, I am kind of tied to the story indirectly. The girl who was murdered? Her mother was a teacher who worked with my mum, who was also a teacher. That girl also had a crush on me. So yeah, I knew her. Always kind of felt bad that I rebuffed her advances so much. But I thought she was a bit weird and just didn't like her. So that's that. I love waking up in the dark, 
am walking the sunrise with my dogs. I didn't intend to own two huskies in a German Shepherd mix, but they each found me, and I couldn't turn them away. We usually jog about five miles daily, often in the neighborhood, but nearly as often, I load us up into the van and drive 10 minutes to the wooded metro park. I love it there. They offer some trails that allow quads and motorbikes, some cycles and skis, some just people. And last year they opened a new one that allows pets. It's a five mile loop into the area farthest from the city. We live on the northern edge of town, but in the dark, with no leaves on the trees, you can clearly see the red glow of the CVS sign for most of the hike. These are tamed woods with asphalt paths and concrete fire pits and rangers patrolling regularly. And the hospital behind CVS means there's emergency medical care in walking distance. I was up coughing again in the night I had a serious case of pneumonia two months ago and was not fully recovered when this sinus infection hit me. I'm past the fever part, so we're walking again, but not yet jogging. But after being up in the night, I didn't get up in time to go walk before I dropped my kids off at school. Then my youngest had an appointment and then I had to run a few errands. And then we had unexpected visitors right after school. And then they stayed for dinner. And finally, I got the dogs into the van and we made it to the park just before it got dark. I was irritated at all the little things that had kept me from my walk all day. But as we drove all the way to the back of the park, I realized we'd be walking the sunset, watching it over the lake and the hills and throughout the bare trees. As the park was clearing out now, as it started to get dark, we may very nearly have the place to ourselves and might not have to pull off the path to let others pass us. An amazing number of people who are afraid of dogs hike the pet path. All those little irritations had led up to this singular moment of beauty. I would not otherwise have been able to appreciate. This was going to be a really good walk. Funny how life works out when you let it. I parked in my spot at the furthest end of the parking lot by the bathrooms. A mile long path looped through the woods and by the lake and came out by the bathrooms. I liked to run it when I came here alone as that one was walkers or jogging only. It was a glorious walk through a Bob Ross painting. My mind cleared and my thoughts quieted and I simply experienced the woods. My feet on the path my dogs panting, the nature sounds, the beauty of the sky. I absolutely loved it. About halfway now, and the city sounds had faded away until I could only hear the birds, the frogs, and insects all singing their songs of territory and mating and life. When there was a crack, breaking the utter silence and absolute stillness. My dogs and I turned instantly towards the source of the sound and froze. Behind us and to the right, the sound had come from the crest of a hill. I could see nothing and heard only the dogs panting. I waited for the nature sounds to return, but they did not. All three of the dogs slowly raised their ruffs, fur standing on end 
around their shoulders and neck, tails held tall and proud, making themselves look larger and more threatening. I took a step towards them, and the female husky, the leader of my little pack, instantly put her ears back and her head down and pulled me to the path. All three of them left their tails and ruffs up, but the two males also put their ears back and heads down and began to pull me. So off we went. The woods were still silent. We must have startled a buck on the slope of the hill and not seen him. And after we passed, he leapt up the hill and jumped a dead tree and his hoof hit a dead branch and the branch broke, crack and scared everyone. Why were the woods still silent though? Maybe there was someone up there. Homeless people stay here sometimes. The bathrooms have heat so the pipes don't freeze. This is about as far out as the path goes. It would be a good place to sleep. Maybe he's getting up a shelter and a crack broke the branch. Why were the woods still silent though? We were about as far away from the city as we could get in these woods and you couldn't see the CVS sign or the glow from the streetlights or even hear the traffic noises. We were deep. It was dark and still and absolutely quiet, except for the panting dogs and four sets of footsteps on the path. I wanted to run. The dogs wanted to run. It must have been a Bigfoot breaking a log, telling me to get out. But there are no Bigfoot in city limits. I promise you that, Brain. It was a deer. The woods are still quiet because of us. I have 200 pounds of dog hair. They're all big huskies. And another 200 pounds of me. Yeah, I'm a little fat, but I've got good muscle underneath. I have broad shoulders that don't fit into women's shirts and big hands that don't fit into women's gloves and can lift a hundred pounds over my head. We are the scariest thing in the woods. There are no bear, there are no wolves and no Bigfoot. There are deers, there are foxes and there might be an angry raccoon, but we are the biggest, baddest, scariest thing here. Unless there's someone with a gun, my mind says. Shut up, you're not helping brain. The dogs had not stopped once to sniff or mark. Heads down, ears back, tails and ruffs still held high. They just wanted to go. We'd gone almost a mile now, me craning my head the whole time, trying to see as far as I could in all directions, while letting the dogs pull me down the path. And it was still absolutely silent. Not an overflying goose, not a cricket, nothing moved, nothing made a sound, except us. Here came the third and longest of the three steep hills on the trail. I had been running these to rebuild my strength and endurance, but if I ran this, I'd be blown at the top. The top where it curved around as it crested and you couldn't see anything past the thick trees. The top where if you were deeper in the woods, you could follow a more gradual ridge up to the crest of the hill and wait unseen for someone to come up the path. Ambush. It was a deer. Turn around. It was just a deer. But what if it's behind us? It's an ambush. Is it a deer? Do they have a gun? And this is why I ran. The noises in my head were unbearable. Up the hill, I walk. I pay attention and I watch the dogs. They were still on alert but did not hesitate to go up the hill. In fact, they wanted to go faster. Just walk, don't get smoked. 
Be able to run or fight if you have to. I'm scared. The woods should not be silent. The dogs should not still be on alert. It's not a cat or a bear or a wolf and I really doubt it's a Bigfoot. It could be a person. So let's be smart, just walk. We are not good prey. The dogs will protect me. The huskies might not alone, but the shepherd will and they will follow his lead. Be smart, get out. All I could think to myself. There was only another mile now until the lake and the first parking lot. Then another half mile along the lake to the second lot, where my van was. Hearing traffic noises now, but still no birds, no crickets and no frogs. The smell almost stopped me in my tracks, but the dogs kept pulling. Sour and grassy and oddly metallic. And shit? Shit and blood? And partially digested grass? I smelled the contents of a deer's stomach. Someone hunted in these woods. And the dogs were not interested in the smell. We ran. I don't remember much of that last mile. We just ran. Denza, the big female husky, finally stopped to drink some lake water as we came out by the parking lot. Then she began to sniff and pee, the boys following her lead. There was a single truck parked. I relaxed quite a bit, but still felt on edge. Down the lake in the parking lot, I could see headlights. They must be parked at the turnaround at the end of the lot closest to the lake, as they illuminated the lakeside path. They were watching us. Halfway to the van now, and the car drove away. Twenty feet from the van, I heard a motor coming down the nearest path. I decided to put the dogs in the car on the driver's side instead of the passenger's side like normal. The sound of the motor came closer. The leashes caught on the armrest, and I had to untangle them before the dogs could jump into the van. The motor came closer down the path. I had to be gone before it came out. I knew it with absolute certainty. Finally, the dogs were in. I slammed the door and jumped in the front, fumbling for the lock button, shaking hands, unclipping the keys from my jogging belt and starting the car and gunning it into reverse. And as my headlights swept over the entrance of the path by the bathrooms, they lit up a four-wheeler coming out of the woods. I was dropping the transmission into drive and hitting the gas. And as my brain processed what my eyes saw, it informed me that there was something across the handlebar. A gun? A deer carcass? I couldn't tell because of the angle when pulling away. I couldn't see him in the rearview mirror. It was the second to last night at my camp. This night and the next were usually reserved for this thing called a shepherd watch. It was a Christian camp, which is where the kids and counsellors take shifts through the night to watch the fire and such, just like shepherds did with their sheep. This night, my watch was from 11pm to 1am, and I wasn't really dreading it, as I'm used to staying up late anyway. So, to give you a visual for my location, the camp is located on a lake and a small mountain. The mess hall, main office and other buildings are down at road level and the cabins are up on the mountains spaced apart from each other. The youngest kids got the cabins closest to the bottom and the older kids got the further ones. I was a sophomore in high school at the time and so my campsite was a little past halfway up. Another thing you have to understand is that the camp is in the woods. You have to drive off the main turnpike down a dirt road for two miles before you actually get to camp. So as you imagine, we were surrounded by wildlife and lots of it. It's about 7 p.m. and the sun is just about to go down and my group of campers and another group were down at the family camp. 
which is meant for the daycare service people, for little kids. Or a place to bring tents and camp out with your family, as it wasn't just a summer camp. It's a big open meadow with a large picnic area in the centre. We were playing manhunt, which is kind of like hide and seek mixed with tag. And me and my friend Dom were way off in the woods, probably a lot further than we needed to be really when we started to hear what sounded like dozens of footsteps. The faint barks and howls confirmed my guess that it was a pack of coyotes roaming around this area. Needless to say, we were a little nervous, but I had been out in the woods enough times to know that they wouldn't really bother us unless provoked or rabid, and since they were in a pack, that ruled out the latter. We started to jog back towards the camp, when out of nowhere chaos explodes behind us. The pack had encountered something that it either attacked or attacked it. We froze in our tracks and listened to the sound of yelping, barking, growling and howling, followed by the sound of flesh being ripped off something. The entire camp could no doubt hear what was going on just outside the play area where dozens of kids are roaming around. So the counsellors decided it would be a perfect time to blow their emergency whistles and get all the kids away from the snarling, bloodthirsty canines, just a few hundred yards away from me and Don. While the two of us were sprinting through the woods trying to get back to safety, I swear that I could hear something coming up from behind us. Not only that, but I could feel something behind us. I didn't dare turn around to check, for fear of tripping over a stick or root and letting whatever was behind us catch up. I just screamed to run faster, and we eventually made it out of the tree line and back to the group. I asked Don if he saw anything behind us. He says that he didn't see anything, but definitely felt something there. Later that night, the two groups, including mine, made their way up to a big fire pit, complete with rudimentary benches fashioned from logs and put into a half circle around the fire pit. It even had its own cabins, if the camp had more programs running for kids there. The campers were tasked with gathering firewood for an all-nighter, so everyone was out in the dark woods with nothing but a flashlight and hopefully a buddy carrying armloads of firewood. I was more or less self-appointed to making the actual fire, mostly because I make huge fires, and I started with a simple small log cabin style build, and slowly built outwards from it, until I was using sticks that were about five feet in length, and five to six inches in diameter. So it was pretty impressive, maybe a little too massive. While all of this was going on, I couldn't stop thinking of what had happened earlier, and every time I thought about when we felt as if something were chasing us, my heart would start thumping, and I would feel as though the creature were right behind me. At around 9pm, I heard the coyote pack again. I've heard many packs and single dogs howling, but I have never heard a pack like this. It was full of anger and hate. It was spewed forth into the night air like they were on a mission to kill. They had an objective, and nothing was going to stand in their way. It started out from what sounded like a few miles away, possibly on a neighbouring peak. The thing is, coyotes travel fast. I alerted one of the senior counsellors, saying that we shouldn't do a shepherd watch because the pack is still around here. He tells me not to worry, that they won't come near us and that they're miles apart. I really wish that were true. All the kids started singing camp songs and telling stories. I was sitting on a log, staring into the forest at about 9.45, when I heard them again, but this time they were closer. By 10.30, everyone is done singing songs and making s'mores, and they just head off to their cabins for the night and the group that had the 11 to 1 watch 
just decided to stay by the flames. The group of me, Dom, and Ashley, who was a girl from our cabin, and two girls and a boy from another camp group, I think his name was Dimitri. Dom gets up to grab more firewood from the ever-dwindling supply. As he gets to the pile, he leaps backwards and falls to the ground, yelping in terror. I spring up and run over to him, flashlight in hand, and I see it. It's a baby deer, or rather, the head of one. I can assure you that it wasn't there earlier, due to the fact that the pile had been trampled all over throughout the night, and as more kids had been collecting wood. Even more so, due to the fact that the blood was still oozing from its freshly torn neck. Whatever had done this was most certainly not a coyote. There was a ping pong ball sized wound right above the ripping point of the neck of the ill fated fawn. So I guess that thing was very, very big indeed. I dragged Dom to his feet and pushed him back towards the fire circle, screaming at the counselor that we needed to leave now or else we wouldn't make it through the night. I knew this was dramatic, but I was distressed at the time, so bear with me. And as I'm about to start putting the fire out, I see them, dozens of pairs of eyes running all around, just on the light's edge, poised to strike. All sounds stop. All I hear is the deafening silence as fear courses through me. I have never been more scared in my life, but somehow I managed to run to the woodpile and grab an armful of firewood and throw it onto the fire. I tell everyone to grab their stuff and go, and tell them to run into the cabin that was there. Grab a stick that looks strong, but lightweight enough to swing, and run after the rest of the group. As I'm about to start stepping up onto the steps of the cabin, I hear the sound of something running towards me. Without thinking, I turn around and swing at whatever it was, just narrowly missing its head. In the dim moonlight, and the stretching arms of the firelight, I saw that it wasn't a coyote, and I honestly don't know to this day what it was. I hope what I saw wasn't real, and that it was just a trick of the light. Deep down though, I think I know what I saw. There are some things that I might just rather forget. This was probably around four or five years ago. Four friends and I had been talking about ghost experiences and such, when we decided to try and find some places to go investigate for fun. A quick bit of research revealed some stories about a place called Old House Road. Claims of a witch, green lights from the ground, and a ghost ship that sailed over the beach and anchored. We decided to take the three hour drive to go visit. The road itself was probably a mile and a half, maybe two, gravel road, surrounded by grass and weeds, and plants at least six foot tall. It's right by the water, a little private beach. On this road, perhaps two thirds of the way, is a little old abandoned house, and there was not a single source of light on the whole stretch. So we drove down all the way, noting that it's pretty dark here. We parked by the beach, stepped out, and walked as a group towards the house. We take a couple of turns and such, before we reach a long straight way to the house. We're walking and talking, searching for things with our flashlight, when someone points out a light in the distance. This light, we all observed, was down near where the house was, but directly in the path. We kept walking, slightly cautious now, this is when we realize that the light is getting closer than we expect. We stop, and the light continues to come closer. It's at this point I observe that it's not like a flashlight or a car light. This is a torch, 
or a lantern, swaying slowly back and forth as it approaches, and it's not illuminating anything behind it. My friend Jay is the only other one in this group that has experience for searching with things like this. He taps me on the shoulder and whispers, shark attack. He meant that the lantern was a distraction. So we both turned around just to see two small red lights peering over the tall grass before quickly dropping back down into said grass. At this point, everyone else is transfixed on the light ahead. So me and Jay calmly turned everyone around and said tonight is not the night to be messing with this. We got everyone back into the car calmly before we explained what we'd seen. Once at the car, I decided to step back and see if anything had followed. I walked towards the first turn where I could still be seen. I heard some movement ahead and said hello, and promptly got hit by a rock. Not hard though, it was on my knee. I was more confused than anything. I received another rock, and this time it was to my chest. I got the message, it means get the hell out. So I go back, we all go into the car, and decide it's time to return home. It's worth noting that on the drive down the road, we saw absolutely no sign of lights, or people, or anything. Just the same empty road we'd taken to get there. We left Old House Road shortly after. At this point, we discussed the fact that we drove three hours to spend 15 minutes in one spot. Consensus was, screw that. So we looked for a place that was in our own path home. And boy, did we find something. I will probably never remember the name of the bridge, but I'm sure I could text Jay and find out. The place was an overpassing bridge in the middle of nowhere, on some side street that was probably 15 miles long. We drive over there, someone reading the claims out to everyone. The story goes that there was a bride who ran from her arranged marriage on her wedding day, running over the bridge stopping and jumping off in her wedding gown and dying. Neat, right? Coupled with that was very factual and documented evidence of KKK activity in the 70s. They'd hung many people on this road, hanging off trees right next to it. So, not cool. What were the problems, you ask? They say that if you parked your car under said overpass, you could hear the bride fall onto your car, see handprints on your mirrors, but see no corpse. They also claimed that if you parked there, your battery would die and car would become inoperable. Tow companies came out a lot apparently, and further down the road, people claimed seeing dead men hanging in the trees. We go down the road, and this overpass is nestled neatly in the lowest part of the valley, made by two moderately sized hills. You can see the top of another side around the bridge. Not very intimidated, we made the decision not to stop under the bridge, for we were all hours from the house, and just decided to screw that. We drive under it and saw nothing. It was very uneventful, so we continued down the road. I can't explain how dark this road was. No street lights, no signs, no anything. Just dense woods on either side of the street. As unsettling as that was, we found a little wider dirt shoulder and turned around maybe a third of the way down the road. Back under the bridge we go. Pass number two was interesting. We go down back the hill and pass the bridge. As we do, the car lights are very noticeably dim and then come back. Everyone saw it. Intrigued now, we U-turn and like typical young people, we drive down once more. 
This time the car audibly stutters, and we all feel it. Well, damn. We U-turn, cross the fourth time, and the car radio shuts off, and the car almost completely stalls. This is the point where we should call it. It's close to the witching hour. We've already had an encounter, and the car is threatening to die on us. But alas, we're dumb. So onwards we go. We drive, and as we're approaching the bridge, we see headlights on the other side. So we stop, feeling slightly compelled to. This is where it gets weird. We had a couple of people recording at this point, and we all are very distinctly pointing out two pairs of headlights descending the opposite hill. Four in total. This man is not wearing a uniform or badge, but is driving a local police vehicle. He rolls down his window and stops. No blue lights. He tells us that they've been monitoring our traffic patterns since we'd been there and told us it was illegal to be driving back and forth on this road like that. Top that all off, he just seemed abnormal. His facial expression was fairly locked in place. He spoke very slowly and deliberately, and it was just off-putting. I apologize, but it's hard to put into words. It just felt wrong. Regardless, he told us to leave, and then watched us three-point turn, and then go away. He drove off with us behind him until the stop sign. He turned right, and GPS told us to follow him. When we do, he's gone. We were very shaken. We stop at a gas station for snacks and nicotine. We exchange a review or two of the three videos recorded, and point out the distinct four lights. But the back two that disappeared when they reached the bridge weren't connected like headlights almost like it were two motorcycles. If I ever get the chance, I'll get someone who might have the video and upload them. But that's a good one. It got to us, and we didn't go out like that again. But I do joke around about going to Old House Road again sometime. I just want to know what we've experienced and what it could mean. It was a very beautiful night in Panama City Beach. The stars were out, crisp and clear, about 50 degrees outside, very calm, no real breeze, and absolutely gorgeous. Not desolate, but not crowded either. It was literally the perfect night. I was at Pier Park, which is a big shopping area main street kind of thing, with a pier at the end of it on the beach. I walked out a little ways onto the boardwalk that takes you to the beach, and noticed what I thought was someone jogging on the beach. Which was weird, because joggers pretty much always have a headlamp or flashlight, if they are out this late. Whatever this thing was, didn't. About the time, I noticed they were going really fast to be a jogger, or a runner, or Usain Bolt for that matter. They were right near the water's edge, going what had to be at least 30. Their legs weren't moving. It was just this strange silhouette, moving very fast. It finally disappeared over one of the sand dunes. I'm very, very skeptical, and usually find stuff like this to be completely absurd. I don't know what it was. Alien? Ghost? Some insanely efficient Olympic track runner? I don't know. Me and my girlfriend both saw it, and it creeped us the hell out. It moved in a way that followed the contour of the sand, and was really, really weird.
We were out in a state park, tent camping, not far from civilization. There were three of us. After drinking a bit too much and some other partying, we hiked a bit up the mountain behind our camp. Stupid. It was pitch black with a very steep incline. About thirty minutes into the hike, in the middle of nowhere, we see a structure. It's a door, and not much else. The door is built into a brick building. It had four walls, but the structure was so small and built, just for the door. The front was about six feet wide, and then from the front to the back, it was probably two feet. I know it doesn't sound that creepy, but when you find a closed door on a tiny brick building thrown into the party, it becomes really creepy. Turns out the door was unlocked, so we opened it, and there's no floor inside, but a ladder going down. You bet your ass, none of us had the balls to go down. We dropped some rocks, and it took quite a while to hit the bottom. No splash, just a solid smack of rock against concrete. There wasn't much else we could do. Shit was really strange. I have no recollection of where it was, and I don't ever want to go back. I was working in the Czech Republic at kids' summer camps when I was twenty. It was nothing like the American summer camps that I've seen on TV. It was far more relaxed. We owned a huge cabin in the forest just outside a small town. There were walking tracks around, and people could walk past our cabin and field area from time to time. One time, I was doing some craft with a small group of children at a table. That can be seen from the walking tracks when this guy walks by. He's about thirty, had dreadlocks, and is alone, wearing heavy boots, these patchwork pants, and a loose metal signet. He stops mid-walk when he spots us and begins to approach. He asks me in Czech if I have any cigarettes. I tell him that I don't speak Czech very well. In an attempt for him to give up and leave, I'm trying to be nice because I have five kids here sitting at the table, and I don't want to scare them. He then switches to English. It was like a fifty-fifty chance he wouldn't speak English in this part of the country, and he begins commenting on my tattoos as I have a sleeve. He's asking me all this stuff, saying he's getting a new one, asking about the cigarettes again. And I say no. I was being polite about the tattoos, but I'm not encouraging this conversation. He asks me my name, and I tell him, which keeps him talking for a bit. And after a while, he moves on. I sigh with relief, and the day continues. Later that afternoon, it was around six. The light is still out, and we were killing time before dinner was being served. I was in the field outside the cabin. With some kids running around, other leaders were doing various activities with kids. When all of a sudden, another leader got my attention and told me to get the kids inside. I look up on either side of the field where the trees start, and there are guys all dressed similarly to the guy earlier, standing just back from the tree line. They'd spread out in different angles, and then I hear someone shout my name. We move all the kids inside and lock the doors. The three male leaders we have go out to speak to the guys in the forest surrounding our cabin. I hear them say, "We're here hunting for deer." Thought we saw it coming through this way. Anyway, I'm a friend of, and then he says my name. I start freaking out. I can't believe it's the same guy from the morning. He says, "I want to show her my new tattoo." Confused, the leaders come back and are like, "Who are these guys?" They know I'm not Czech, and I don't know many people outside our circle, so I know it's odd. I tell them about the morning, and, and that I don't want to see him again. They go back out and tell these guys to leave after some fuss and yelling. The rest of the trip, I was paranoid that they'd return, especially at night. Luckily for me. 
they did. I am a 17 year old female. I'd like to start off by saying that most consider me an intimidating person by nature. My close friends don't really believe that, but they know that I most definitely do not mess around when it comes to certain situations, whether it's telling someone to piss off, as much as I hate to admit it, or getting physical with someone. I've never really had someone approach me in public, thinking of getting the best of me, if that makes sense. About half a year ago, I was at my then house, rolling some joints with my girlfriend. I live somewhat in the middle of nowhere, and there are lots of trees in my area, and they are also in my backyard. I wouldn't classify it as a whole ass forest, but it's not small enough to simply be a grove. There's wildlife there though. My girlfriend and I hadn't smoked much that day, and we were home alone, and seeing as we could do anything we wanted, we decided to smoke these while taking a bit of a nature walk. And it seemed like an absolutely amazing idea at the time. My girlfriend sat next to me while I rolled the Harvested God's Gift in the paper. We were talking about random stuff and listening to heavy metal as I focused on rolling those sweet, sweet spliffs. I had finished rolling and we finally decided to leave my house and walk into the plain woods, which at the time had never been intimidating to me or anyone I'd been in there with, unless they were just major cowards by nature or had anxiety. I have the joints in my pocket. We leave and we're walking through my backyard towards one of the many trails from my place. I should also mention it was summer, so it was only 7 p.m and it wouldn't be getting dark for maybe two and a half to three hours. We light up, and for about an hour or so, it's fine. We're just talking, kissing, basic couple stuff, and we're on our second joint, just walking along the paths. Then we see this big, flat rock, like a pancake boulder. Hell yeah! We sit on it and lay down, the two of us sit like that for a while, holding hands, and passing the joint between us. Perhaps half hour after, we start hearing noises. I'd also like to mention at this point that the sun was starting to set, and perhaps there was another 30 minutes of daylight left. And that's when we started hearing the noises. We're obviously really freaked out by the sounds, and internally blamed it on the weed, making us a little paranoid. There was wildlife in the forest, as I'd mentioned. We were trespassing in their backyard, so why should we mind a cute bunny family making their way downtown? After a while of silence, we heard a noise that we both know damn well, and it's not an animal. We heard what sounded like someone running a sharp object against a solid but jagged surface, like a rock. It was pretty far away, but somehow it was loud enough that we heard it. It was faint though. We look at each other and immediately sit up. We don't see anything. I stand up and urge her to do the same as well. This most definitely wasn't the forest fairies we had planned on seeing. We stand for a minute or so, and then we hear a big snap, like a tree branch getting stepped on with a ton of force, and then fast footsteps, like some dude sprinting. I freak out and go into panic mode, as I'm wary to admit. And of course, we were deep into the woods. I urge my girlfriend Kimber to run faster, and all the way towards my house. Now my girlfriend and I aren't exactly sporty people, we're more of the academic bunch, and we weren't completely out of shape, but looking back on it, it would have been a hell of a lot easier for us had we done cross country or track or something. She runs in front of me, and I'm a little further ahead. We aren't on trail at this point, and twigs and leaves are completely shredding our faces, necks, legs and arms. We hear this person, who's obviously running after us, start a hooting and hollering, 
like some damn inbred from the hills have eyes. That makes us soil ourselves, and we run faster. We're sprinting, huffing and puffing like fat kids during the mile or something. The person is unfortunately closer at this point, and I look back and see him. He's an older guy, about 40s give or take, with long hair and thin as hell. He's scraggy looking. This, of course, makes me defecate pure cement. I yell at my girlfriend to hurry up, and she does. I look behind me again, and he is gaining on us. She makes a turn, and I recognize it as being the one to my house. The turn was abrupt, and I thank Jesus because the guy must have been too close to process the turn. We turn off, and see the lights of my house in the almost darkness. Seeing this beacon of hope made us run even harder. This guy can't be seen, and we make it to my cleared backyard. My girlfriend runs up the back porch and rips the sliding door open, letting me in and locking it. She slams the blinds down to cover the door, and we make sure all the doors and windows are locked. I feel my back pocket for my phone and realize that, of course, it's somewhere in those damn trees. My girlfriend's phone is dead. No house phone, because who the hell has those anymore? It was a burden at the time. My girlfriend then breaks down, having a panic or anxiety attack. I'm not sure which one. We plug in her phone, get it charging, and I turn off all the lights, except for the ones by our doors. I saw no signs of the man for the rest of the night, and for the rest of the time I'd lived there. Her phone charged and we called the cops, and they surveyed the area and found nothing. It was terrifying for me, and I can only imagine it's worse for my girlfriend, who suffers from anxiety. When I took the plane to Istanbul with my classmates in 2012 or 2013, I saw somewhere over the route from Germany to Turkey a weird black round object in the sky. When I told my female friend who was sitting next to me, we both started freaking out and filmed the entire thing. But you can't see it on our cell phones since there were too many water droplets on the window and that black thing was too far away. It was something small and round and some other round object was flying around the main object surrounded by black smoke. It was so beautiful. I was sure it was some technology from the government. I regret not screaming inside the plane and making everyone aware of it. Imagine everyone if they'd have seen it. They'd have freaked out, and our plane would have probably gone missing. What if it was top secret? But jokes aside, I'll never forget this incident. When I told my aunt, she told me that I was too stressed and needed to take a break, as I was imagining things. My next two encounters, where I saw something strange, I can't explain either. I was in elementary school, sixth grade. I was outside going to our PE classes with my female friend in tow, when I wanted to get inside this building. I saw in front of me, some kind of small white cloud passing by. As weird as it sounds, it was flying by really fast. I told my friend, and she also saw it. But we didn't talk about it again until later. I remember I saw this kind of cloud in my young age again. I don't remember where it was, but I remember I saw this cloud twice. I believe that we were living in a dimension where we can't see everything. For example, that cats and dogs can see things we cannot. Perhaps that cloud was from somewhere where we weren't supposed to see it. I tried finding information on Google regarding both incidences, but I have found nothing. There is one final entry. When I was a child, I slept next to my mother. One night, someone came and put my arm up which hurt me so I screamed. The person ran away, 
and my mum asked me what happened. She told me I shouldn't be scared, that it was my dad. Until today, I can't believe this. When asking my parents, they tell me it was my dad who came and tried to change my bad sleeping position. I can't believe this, because why would he run away when I started to scream and cry? He's not like that. Not to mention the person or thing I saw looked scary. It was dark, and he was pitch black looking, and I could only see his eyes. All I could see was a silhouette. Believe me or not, since then I've had bad dreams of this person every night, when I fall asleep on my left side. I remember my mum told me once, when we were sleeping on our left side, that we have bad dreams. Maybe she was joking, but it left a big impact on me. Every night, I tried to make sure I didn't sleep on my left side, so that I wouldn't see that person again. I saw him several years later. It was a real trauma for me, and I really don't think it was my dad. Finally, there's one more. I was with my family in the living room. All my cousins were there. They'd come from the Netherlands to visit. In the evening, we were telling each other creepy stories. After that, we went into the living room, watched some TV and talked. Suddenly, I saw the other room, where lights were still turned on. I could see on the wall the shadow of a water bottle, but there was something round and huge flying around it. Actually, I kept staring at it and wondering what it could be. Then it stopped. It was very strange. I wish I knew what it was. When I was 10, I was at a lake way out in the woods on some land my dad owned. I was alone aside from my dog, an Airedale terrier. I'd been fishing on the little pier in the southeastern corner for about 10 minutes when I noticed something or someone watching me from the tree line on the other side of the lake. I was only about 10, but I kept my composure. For some reason I felt it important that whatever slash whomever it was did not know that I was aware. Anyway, it started moving slowly from tree to tree, never taking its eye off me. The lake was about 75 yards wide, so I couldn't see any details, but I could tell which way the figure was facing. I realized that it was stalking me, and I nonchalantly put my pole down and walked down to the pier and up the bank towards the trail back to our cabin. Once I hit the tree line, I hauled ass to the cabin and waited there with one of my dad's guns until my parents got home. The only witness I had was my dog, and he saw it as well. I know because he was staring intently at the figure while giving a low growl until I quietly told him to stop. I have no idea who or what it could have been, but I now know its intentions were most definitely not good. In the early 90s, we didn't live there, as our home was in Mobile, Alabama. But we spent most weekends up there. I know it could have been a person, but the nearest neighbor was a very old couple that lived a few miles away. The closest paved road was a good 15 to 20 minute drive away from our land. Aside from the lake and the open area our cabin was on, the surrounding area was a really thick forest. The figure was extremely tall as well. I have an extremely good memory, especially for details. Also, shortly before I actually noticed it, I got a very strong, I'm going to be watched by something dangerous feeling. I've never felt safe there again. And I was glad when my dad sold it and got a place near Gulf Shores. My husband and I are amateur mushroom hunters. Three seasons out of the year, 
We spend weekends in forests, along nature trails and rivers, looking for edible and interesting wild mushrooms to harvest. Springtime brings the most exciting hunt, which is for the highly coveted morels. We know of a special stretch of shoreline along the river that has a few dozen morels each year. It's difficult to get to, as it's off the proper path, and you have to do quite a bit of ducking, climbing, and maneuvering to get to it. One day, two years ago, we were doing just that, making our way slowly and searching carefully for the mushrooms hiding in plain sight. We were so preoccupied with our task that we did not know how long we were being watched or followed. But at one point, we saw a man up ahead of us, looking at us and not saying anything or moving almost like he was waiting to be noticed. My husband saw him first and turned to shoot me a look, because we never encountered anyone in that spot before. It was besides a small and fairly busy path, but people didn't stray from the paved paths much. There was a weird energy about the man that can be best described as vaguely menacing. We were near the end of where we wanted to look, Anyway, so we turned around and started walking our way back. When we looked behind us a few moments later, the man was gone. We wrote it off as just some weirdo, perhaps a homeless guy whose territory had been wandered into. We continued looking over the spots we had already covered in case we'd missed any more owls, with me in front and my husband right behind me. Looking back every few places, as we were feeling more paranoid as we went along. All of a sudden, I look up from the ground at my feet and the man is blocking our path about 30 feet ahead. He had to have taken the riverbank and crept up alongside us on the path in order to get ahead of us so that he could cut us off the way he had. I whipped around with huge eyes at my husband who looks over my shoulder, sees him, and starts to move up the hill on our right as the riverbed was to our left, grabbing my hand to pull me with him. Adrenaline shot us out of the thick brush and onto the paved path in the open park. Without speaking, we broke into a sprint towards the direction of our car several blocks away. When we were far enough away from the riverbank to risk a backwards glance, we saw the man emerge from the brush. He just stood there watching us leave, motionless. We speculated the entire ride home what he wanted from us, knowing it was nothing innocent. To this day it still bothers me, and I wonder what would have happened if we had been spread apart further while we hunted, or if either of us had been alone. I don't think I want to find out.